nicer background image. <laughs> it's the galaxy. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Saturday morning plenaries for our 25th annual Mars Society Convention. I would like to welcome Dr. Albert, Albert Haldeman from ESA. He is ESA's Mars Chief Engineer. Welcome, Dr. Haldeman. You have the floor. Thank you, um, and uh, I'll get started here. I'm uh, good morning. <laughs> Uh, I want to tell you about exploring Mars uh, with the European Space Agency, and as announced, uh, I am the Mars Chief Engineer within the Directorate of Human and Robotic Exploration here at ESA, um, and uh, I uh, am happy to take note of this 25th Annual International Mars Society Convention. I participated in the first convention 25 years ago, so this is a bit of, a, uh, of an anniversary. So I want to give the um, attendees, can you all hear me okay? I guess so. Um, that uh, we are ESA. What is ESA? The European Space Agency, give a little bit of context since not everybody may be familiar. Um, the European Space Agency is a little bit different than national space agencies. It is a uh, treaty-based international organization with 22 member states and four associate member, uh, four associate member states and one cooperating state. Um, and uh, it is, uh, its objective is the exploration and use of space for exclusively peaceful purposes. Uh, we have seven sites across Europe and uh, our headquarters is in Paris and launches by the European Space Agency take place from uh, French territory in French Guyana. Um, our annual budget is smaller than NASA's, um, is around about six and a half billion euros uh, per year. Um, that amounts to 12 euros per European citizen. Um, and we're hoping uh, to increase that budget uh, this year to uh, take a step towards more European independence in space due to recent geopolitical developments. Um, nevertheless, uh, it's a smaller space agency um, than, uh, than NASA and it has some differences. We do, we do all aspects of space. Um, we do uh, communications and uh, earth observation and navigation. So uh, the European Galileo system is done by ESA, not by a different agency. Um, we do space, uh, space safety, space security. We do operations and 
technology development, and we do exploration and discovery, scientific, science and exploration. And that's where the Directorate of uh, Human and Robotic Exploration is housed. The Directorate of Human and Robotic Exploration, that's a little bit different, is we have Mars exploration in the same directorate at ESA as human exploration. Um, and it means we can have synergies between lunar exploration, uh, robotic and human, um, and Mars exploration robotic for the time being in view of human in the future. Um, what ESA has done at Mars in the past and what ESA is doing and planning for Mars in the future is what I want to tell you about today. Um, we have a, a very productive scientific mission, Mars Express, that was launched in 2003. Um, that mission has had its 19th birthday uh, in space and has completed 18 years at Mars. Some of the uh, things that the Mars Express spacecraft has done um, is contribute to the uh, mapping of interesting landing sites, in particular, for example, the Jezero Crater region where the uh, Perseverance rover of the uh, Mars 2020 mission has landed and is collecting samples in view of the Mars sample return uh, campaign. And the uh, interesting clay minerals in the Delta uh, were identified by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, but also by the Mars Express spacecraft instruments in orbit. Um, something more recent is because the Mars Express Orbiter is not in a afternoon um, solar synchronous orbit, but is in a much longer orbit. It gets to view Mars a little bit differently and uh, discovered these elongated clouds associated with our CMONs. They develop in the morning and move uh, westward on the planet during the day, but generally have uh, evaporated or disappeared by the early afternoon when the sun synchronous orbiters tend to cross over the area. Um, so having a different view of Mars than uh, all the other orbiters offers some, uh, some interesting aspects and some synergies and some opportunities for better understanding uh, the environment that we are also enthusiastic about. Um, another, the next spacecraft that uh, ESA, the European Space Agency sent to Mars was the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter, TGO in 2016. Uh, the Trace Gas Orbiter has four scientific instruments for observing the Martian atmosphere primarily. Uh, two instruments, the NOMAD instrument, a, uh, a spectral sounder that looks at, that does solar occultation, and the atmospheric chemistry suite that also does solar occultation. Um, the color and stereo uh, imager, imaging system, CASIS, and then a neutron detector friend. And those have been operating now since uh, for six years um, at Mars. And they were looking for primarily, the goal was to go and look for methane at Mars. And the trace gas orbiter does not see methane. The trace gas orbiter has put upper limits at 20 parts per trillion on methane in the overall atmospheric column. And what's interesting about this is that is in seeming contradiction to the observations at the surface by the Curiosity uh, rover, which in, uh, in Gale Crater sees values that are just below one part per billion. So uh, a couple uh, you know, within an order of magnitude, we're not even seeing that. That suggests that Curiosity is seeing things that are very uh, localized near the surface um, and very transient um, and not globally representative. Um, and as you can see by the many data points and observations uh, from the atmospheric chemistry suite, and there are equivalent ones from NOMAD, um, there are uh, upper limits that basically say that methane is not common in the, in the Mars atmosphere at all. Um, so Curiosity has found an interesting near surface uh, locale. Likewise, um, there are upper limits, uh, not explicit detections on other, uh, uh, on uh, ethane and uh, uh, ethene um, and other gases, which could be related to biological activity or uh, 
sulfur dioxide, um, hydrogen sulfide, which could be related to volcanic activity, and there are upper limits on those, but they're still searching if they find anything more locally uh, emitted, but also not detected. Um, what this is promoting is a lot of innovative chemical and dynamical modeling. So contributing to understanding Mars and realizing how curious Mars is, that there can be some things that are very local uh, near the surface. Uh, one thing that has been detected is uh, HCl, hydrochloric acid, in the Martian atmosphere. That is a detection, and that leads us to try to figure out how chlorine is cycling into the atmosphere. Um, chlorides uh, have been detected on the surface, and so how do those things relate? How does the surface solid phase chlorides get mixed into the atmosphere? Um, or could there be an active volcanic source? This is a, a new branch of study um, to try and figure out how certain resources move around uh, Mars, what their geochemical activity is. The trace gas orbiters color and stereo imaging system um, obtains imagery at five meters resolution uh, with, with very consistent, excellent radiometric calibration. And the uniqueness of this particular imager is on the same orbital track, it can, uh, it does a look forward and then the camera uh, spins around to get stereo looking rearward uh, to the track. So it can get essentially the, uh, the stereo view of a given location pretty much through the same atmospheric column that with the same radiometric calibration. And that means they get very good stereo uh, capability um, that is competitive with and certainly synergistic with uh, other stereo views, even at higher resolution by high rise on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, the imaging, the geologic research that's ongoing is with looking at active processes, landslides, polar seasonal processes, things we want to understand about what is happening on Mars today um, and what that's telling us about modern Mars and linking to past Mars. There are those high resolution digital elevation models uh, are available online. Then what are we developing next um, at ESA? We're working on the Mars sample return program in a cooperation with NASA um, and contributing several elements. Uh, a key element is the sample return, Earth return orbiter, which I'll tell you about. Another element is the sample transfer arm that is part of the uh, sample retrieval lander of MSR. Um, I'll focus on the, the main spacecraft, the ERO. Um, it will, it is a combined electric and chemical propulsion spacecraft that will launch from Earth, transfer to Mars, go into Mars orbit. At Mars orbit, it'll provide relay services for the surface assets of the Mars uh, sample return uh, program, and then uh, monitor the launch of the Mars Ascent vehicle, uh, capture the orbiting samples, and then depart Mars. This means that it, it will be the first spacecraft to do uh, an interplanetary back and forth to Mars. And as you might imagine, that means this has to be a pretty beefy spacecraft. And so I like this next slide, which shows the size comparison between the Mars Sample Return Earth Return Orbiter that uh, the European Space Agency is building um, and a Airbus 320 aircraft. Uh, we're sending a spacecraft to Mars and bringing it back at the end of this decade to bring the first samples back from Mars. A key element, a key technology required for that Earth Return Orbiter is electric propulsion. That is enabling. It means that we will be able to launch this uh, almost seven ton spacecraft on an Ariane 6 rocket, um, a European rocket, uh, and not need a higher performance because we will have the uh, ongoing thrust, the continuous thrust between Earth and Mars from the electric propulsion. Um, we, will, we will use a chemical pr propulsion stage for the Mars orbit insertion on arrival. And um, the electric propulsion then allows the, uh, the mission phases of spiraling down and spiraling up uh, and carrying out the rendezvous. 
Uh, it's based on heritage from the uh, ESA Mercury mission, Pepe Colombo, and it's using uh, five uh, electric propulsion gridded ion thrusters. And we're spending a lot of time now on the qualification of those thrusters for the full lifetime requirements. As you could see in the previous slide, uh, I'll just jump back to that, with the uh, almost 40 meter wingspan of the Earth return orbiter, there's a lot of solar power required to fire those electric propulsion thrusters. And that's why they're those really big solar arrays. And that is what is enabling to get to Mars and back from Mars. Again, it'll be the European Space Agency building the first spacecraft that goes back and forth to Mars. And then there's our uh, much beloved and unfortunately further delayed Rosalind Franklin rover mission that is now proposed to go in 2028. Um, the, ExoMars rover mission is unfortunately a, uh, uh, a bit of a victim of the Ukrainian crisis and uh, current geopolitical situation. Uh, it was part of a cooperation on ExoMars with Roscosmos, the Russian space agency. Uh, and due to the political situation now and the uh, sanctions, we, are, uh, we have discontinued that uh, the cooperation for that rover and surface platform mission and are reconfiguring and are looking forward at the uh, ministerial meeting that endorses every three years the ESA budget. That's this November. There's a proposal to uh, rebuild the, uh, the parts uh, of the program that uh, Russia was contributing, build those in Europe with some cooperation with NASA and then launch in 2028 with a landing in 2030. Um, and as I'll also show on the next slide, the scientific relevance uh, of, this, of this mission remains because it is actually unique. Um, the ExoMars rover landing site is unique. It will be the oldest ever, um, and it'll be the first mission that will probe uh, the early history of terrestrial planets um, at this oldest landing site ever on the Martian surface, so older than the Jezero site uh, where Perseverance is currently. What is also unique is the two meter drill capability, which will be used to extract and investigate subsurface samples. That is a much deeper drilling capability than any other currently planned mission uh, has available. And that is demonstrated and qualified and that will open a new window into uh, Mars research um, to, as the best way to look for potential uh, ancient biomolecules, potential uh, evidence for uh, past life on Mars, help us understand uh, the context of the evolution of life uh, on terrestrial worlds. And finally, the, with that sample from the subsurface opening the third dimension, uh, of terrestrial planet exploration at Mars. Uh, we have already developed and qualified a unique integrated instrument suite that uh, will be used. And um, it's conceived to its difference compared to the, uh, the Perseverance and to the uh, Curiosity rover is that the same sample will be examined by multiple instruments. Um, it's not one sample provided to a single instrument. And that, uh, the rover is ready. Uh, it was tested, it was qualified, it was delivered. We'll have to do some maintenance on it to maintain it and uh, uh, make sure that, all, that uh, everything is robust and ready uh, for a launch in 2028. And I wanna thank you all for your enthusiasm this morning, early for you. <laughs> and uh, see if there might be any questions from the room. I don't know if that's possible. Okay, can you hear me, Dr. Haldeman? Yes, I can. Okay, I'm gonna ask for questions. Any questions? All right.
Good afternoon, uh, sir. Well, I presume it's afternoon where you are. Okay. Yes, it is. Um, so uh, you mentioned methane, and I, I know you're not the, the chemist on the spot, but uh, do you have any uh, observations from the instruments regarding the uh, presence of superthermal electrons in the Mars environment as observed during the CSS flyby in October 2014? Uh, there are, uh, indeed, Mars Express has been, uh, I don't know about superthermal electrons, but Mars Express in 18 years has been uh, observing the, uh, the extended atmosphere and the, uh, um, the space environment in, uh, in and around Mars because of its larger, its, its larger orbit compared to many other instruments. And that information, uh, it has uh, detectors that have mapped um, the, uh, the, the particles and fields in the near Mars environment. So there is information available um, that is coordinated also with the MAVEN mission. Um, and uh, there are some recent publications on that that I know of. I don't have a slide today, I'm afraid. Um, another thing that is done to examine that uh, by ESA is we, we're doing uh, radio occultation measurements between Mars Express and the Trace Gas Orbiter, and that is indeed sensitive to the ionosphere, um, the, the ionosphere uh, of, uh, of Mars, where there would be electrons moving around. Um, and so those occultations, uh, rather than being a single instrument on a single spacecraft, uh, there are mutual occultations between those two spacecraft uh, multiple times per day. And they're doing, an they're doing some observations every few weeks. So building up a larger database, that's been ongoing for the last year or 18 months, those mutual occultations. That took some time to, uh, to develop that technique uh, and it's been, uh, been productive so far. Okay. So Thank I think you. I addressed your question without giving you a specific answer. I apologize. But you I did. I've read the papers on the subject. I just wondered what you knew about it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I, this is Robert Subrin. Um, I noticed that you're using this extremely large electric propulsion spacecraft to move a few kilograms of sample from Mars to Earth. Now, it's true that the electric propulsion has many times the specific impulse of chemical propulsion, but the Delta V to go from LEO to low Mars orbit and back to LEO with electric propulsion is only, it, it only uh, is <laughs> 30 kilometers a second. Whereas the Delta V to go from low earth orbit to uh, uh, Mars orbit capture with chemical propulsion is only about uh, uh, five and a half kilometers a second, then another one and a half kilometers a second to come back. So you, you've got a bigger uh, exhaust velocity, but more than four times the delta V, and you're carrying this enormous weight of all these solar panels. It seems bizarre. Was there a requirement to use electric propulsion in this mission in order to please the electric propulsion uh, constituency? Uh, I don't believe that was the case, and I, I guess I don't. Uh, I'm not as quick as you, uh, <laughs> uh, Robert, on on the uh, the delta V math there. But certainly, um, we did look at uh, doing it all all uh, chemical propulsion, um, and that that would have made it a much heavier spacecraft um, than than the way we're doing it now. So. Um, we might have had smaller solar arrays, but the uh, the chemical propulsion needs for the for the delta V, which also includes some station keeping, lowering the altitude in order to capture um, and circularizing it. So the delta V indeed is is lower for chemical propulsion, especially if you do uh, uh, um, aero braking. Um, but the timelines are not opportune for, for doing it that way. Um, so we have a, it, the, the trades were all done. Uh, this really is a, is a solution that, uh, now what there was a requirement for was to use a European rocket. Um, <laughs> and that indeed led us to, to the lighter weight option, which yes, it has giant solar panels. 
Um, but uh, it's, it is staged, as I said, there is a chemical propulsion element being used for the Mars orbit injection, um, but to have a chemical system available for the return um, was more prohibitive than the, uh, than the electric propulsion. If you're, I, questions? I, I think, I suppose somewhere there might be a, I'll, I'll have to track it down and I can send it to you if there was a, I think a paper a few years ago doing the, uh, okay. explaining the I trade. Have... Go ahead, next question. Yeah, I hope this was easier. So um, could you describe the landing site a little bit more? Um, maybe I missed it, but, um, you know, is it in the Southern Hemisphere? Is it in the mountains? Oh, is, it, uh, is it more challenging to land on um, for that age? And then uh, we, we all saw that the drill um, in, in our recent probes has had some trouble, just like digging my backyard. They run into rocks. Um, how are you avoiding that problem? How are you going to make sure that you get to the depth you want in your drill? So sort of a two-part question. Okay, so two-part question. So the landing site for, uh, for Rosalind Franklin is selected at Oxyoplanum, that uh, if you search uh, Rosalind Franklin landing site or ExoMars landing site, you should be able to find that, um, that explanation. We're not changing the landing site. It is in the lowlands. It is in the, uh, the area um, of, uh, um, it's, it's actually sort of uh, north and east of where Mars Pathfinder landed. Um, so it is in a, at the uh, mouth of an outflow channel, um, but in a, in a exhumed area um, that, is, that has, by crater counts, older, older surface area. And it has uh, um, clay mineral deposits uh, that are of interest to the science team. Um, so it's uh, the landing site altitude and elevation as far as landing site, and it's also fairly flat. The landing site difficulty is commensurate with, uh, with landing sites for other vehicles that have had uh, landing ellipses of the, of the order that ExoMars will have sort of uh, 100 by, by 30 or 40 kilometer ellipses. Um, and that was already uh, evaluated. Um, the drilling, and I think you're referring to the, the difficulties in getting into the subsurface, that was encountered with um, with the mole system, the HP3 on InSight, uh, which is a very different system. It's not a, it's not a rotary, um, it's not a rotary drill, but was a purely percussive uh, self hammering uh, pro propulsion system to pull itself, if you will, into the subsurface. Um, and it could not go around rocks. However, our drill uh, does go through rocks. Um, very hard rocks will slow us down and take more power, um, but we have demonstrated that we can, we can go into harder rocks. Uh, we do have a, uh, a backup drill bit, um, should that become necessary. Uh, we don't have a lot of, a lot of drill bits, but we've, uh, we've tested the, uh, and qualified the drill bit for the number of samples we expect to collect, which is um, 18 for the uh, nominal science mission. So uh, we've, we've tested it in with, uh, Target soils also evacuated, so under Mars temperature and pressure in a, uh, in a big in a big vacuum and cryogenic tube filled with uh, dirt and soils and rocks um, and layered, and uh, and it works and it it collects samples. It's a little ripper mouth at the bottom uh, is able to extract the samples. So we're looking forward to to giving it a go on Mars. Have another. We have another question. Sure. I was wondering on the Franklin rover with the current Russian landing system off the table. What is there any arrangements being made to replace that with a substitute? That's the whole point. Uh, the proposal, which we are hoping will be uh, endorsed by the uh, Council of Ministers at the end of November, is that we build a similarly sized system to land Rosalind Franklin, uh, build a similarly sized system uh, in Europe. So we're starting from scratch. That's why it's going to take us till 2028. Um, but uh, we, need, uh, we need to rebuild something. So... We have uh, now several of the elements in the uh, landing system, uh, in the Russian landing system, were already European. The onboard computer was European. The uh, radar altimeter uh, was the one that actually did detect the surface on Scaparelli. 
um, in 2016. Um, we have uh, inertial measurement units that are European, and those uh, will be those are going to be recovered and used for the uh, the system that we've built to uh, to replace the uh, what was called the Kazachok lander. We're not loading any scientific instruments on it. We're going to keep it as simple as possible. So it will, the only science we're taking is on the Rosalind Franklin rover. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Halderman. And I appreciate your participation. Thank you. <laughs> Come on in. Thank you, Dr. Haldeman. Okay. Good morning, and I would like to welcome Dr. Jay Hanthanga and Dr. Sergey Shakarev, and they will be discussing Mars exploration using sailplanes and balloons. Welcome. Great, thank you. I want to make sure the camera's on. One thing real quick. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, and uh, we're very grateful for uh, presenting this, um, particularly our, our ongoing research on, on Mars exploration um, using some of the more unconventional methods, uh, sailplanes and, and balloons. Uh, with that said, I wanted to first emphasize that uh, from we're from uh, University of Arizona, and um, our research emphasizes um, putting students uh, front and center in, in much of our research. And so very much uh, thankful for uh, all of their contributions. Uh, University of Arizona has a rich, illustrious history in Mars exploration, as you know, um, with the uh, leading of the Mars Phoenix mission in which uh, water ice was found uh, to the high rise camera where uh, we get all these great pictures uh, using the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, and so uh, ongoing work is it's going in, in, in definitely in the planetary science area, but in this uh, particular presentation, we'll be talking about uh, some of the technology advancements at, at U of A. And so with that, um, with sailplanes and balloons, the potential applications, of course, are for uh, next generation robotic exploration, for supporting uh, future human uh, Mars exploration, of course, um, and setting up services that are gonna have to sustain uh, you know, long-term habitation, exploration, um, and even economic development on, on Mars, including everything from weather stations to comms networks. And then we see a role for, uh, you know, these vehicles in, in all of them. With that said, uh, you know, aerobots uh, in general um, could play a crucial role in, in all of these areas. Um, but I'm gonna first focus on sort of the science area. Um, and, and with science, uh, one of the areas that these unconventional vehicles can tackle is to get to some of the extreme environments and uh, answer some, uh, you know, some of the emerging and, and puzzling questions that still remain. Um, and of course, uh, these are the cliffs, caves, skylights, and uh, canyons. And um, with that said, you know, with launched a whole series of robotic missions to Mars, um, often in, in you know, some of the flat plain uh, regions. 
but there's still a lot of Mars yet to be explored. And, and uh, you guys as a community know this very well. Um, you know, much of the Southern Highlands, the volcanic regions, uh, Valles Marineris, of course, uh, still remain uh, untouched, except for, of course, orbital um, observations. Um, and so to reach those spots uh, would be critical. Uh, it would be critical both for, uh, you know, sustaining human uh, missions, but also asking some of the most intriguing questions about, uh, you know, the, the evolution of Mars, how it went from this um, once ocean world, and that's some of the latest theories now, to this dry desert planet that it is now. And uh, here's another, which are the uh, recurring slope lineas. And these were images observed from uh, the MRO. If you see very carefully along the uh, crater walls, you'll see, uh, you know, uh, stream-like uh, features form. But all of our, um, you know, electronic readings tell us that there's no water there. But how come, you know, we see these, um, uh, you know, formations? And so that remains a, a, quite a mystery. And, and that can be solved by getting close to these spots, getting to these spots when these, you know, intriguing events occur. Uh, but, but short of that, we can't do that with, with current uh, technology as it is. Um, and, and these platforms offer that opportunity. Uh, then of course, search for past life. And, uh, you know, the first fossils, the first intriguing uh, knowledge about, uh, you know, past uh, life, particularly, millions and billions of years ago were found by looking at um, cliffs and, and canyons um, and, and, you know, off the coast of uh, places like Jurassic in England. And um, by looking at these exposed, uh, you know, cliffs, we could identify past life, but also its evolution. And, um, you know, such great places could, could also exist on, on Mars. Um, you know, the grandest of them all, Valles Marineris, um, which, uh, you know, by uh, all of our uh, measurements, you know, is, is the length of our, um, you know, continental U.S. Um, but how do we reach such an such a environment using current mission paradigms? And that's one of the questions with, um, um, that we'll be answering here. The other, of course, is Olympus Mons. And not just you know the volcano here, but the surroundings, where we see a series of lava tubes and lava tube networks, and um, and that could give us a whole insight about the evolution of volcanic activity there. Um, and and Martian pits, and so these are sinkholes that are part of what are thought to be lava tube networks on Mars, and these are some of the pictures uh, taken from MRO. Um, and, and these are all in the, you know, volcanic regions, including what are called the seven sister regions here. Um, some of them could be, um, you know, a reservoir for resources. Others, of course, could be um, shelters, uh, both, both, you know, shelters for, uh, you know, human habitats, but also uh, they could have been the, um, you know, last shelters for, for life if they if they're existed in the, in the past. And, um, and, and so getting to these places and being able to answer these intriguing questions would, would be you know, one of those big and, and critical steps. Uh, and of course, with you know, vehicles like this, coming up with that support system for um, human uh, habitats, um, exploration uh, colonies, and, um, and, and being able to support them, being able to see beyond the next mountain, the next cliff, uh, for, for a multitude of reasons. So one of the first things we'll talk about um, is, is um, balloon systems that we have been uh, envisioning and designing for Mars-like applications. Um, and what we're envisioning for these balloons is that they would be secondary payloads. They'd be carried in CubeSat size uh, deployment systems, and they would be carried as secondary payloads on, on some of the flagship missions. Oftentimes, some of the flagship missions have ballast that could range in the hundreds of kilograms. In fact, on the Mars Science Laboratory mission, there was 190 kilograms of ballast uh, that ended up being tungsten that was dropped off. Some of that could be repurposed for all kinds of interesting uh, secondary missions, uh, just like this. Um, and so they could be envisioned into 12 or 24 units 
They could also have uh, units that could be tethered down from the balloons to be these robotic explorers, what we call tethered robotic explorers. Um, and how would they be deployed? So they would be deployed as secondary, as I had mentioned from uh, the EDL. Um, and uh, depending on the, on the scale, some of them could you know, take their time to you know, first land on the surface of Mars and then uh, float up, but uh, they wouldn't have to actually use extra um, heating systems or, or uh, even, even a chemical gas of any kind. In fact, they could use solar heating, heating off the surface of Mars to uh, float back up. Um, and, and that's some of the technologies that we've been um, exploring here on Earth. And so they would use venting systems to actually control the altitude and using altitude control, they can actually move around. Um, combined with that and, and with uh, you know, these um, systems that uh, sort of a payload that it would carry, it could have gripping systems that could uh, you know, grip onto objects, uh, onto slopes, much like a gecko lizard. And, um, and, and then I'm just gonna show you guys some of our, um, student uh, operated uh, balloon systems here in Arizona, oops, um, that uses the solar uh, heating technology to, to float off. And so all you do is wave it in the Arizona sun for a few minutes. And uh, thanks to the carbon nanoparticles that are inside the uh, balloon structure, they actually heat up and take off. Um, we've had range uh, achieved of up to about 2,000 kilometers. So we've reached um, far ends of Texas and um, southern United States using these balloons. Um, and and uh, with that, you know, quite a um, high resolution payloads, of course, with cameras and, um, you know, weather station type instruments on board. So this is uh, some of what's, what's achievable. But we could do more, particularly by adding robotic instruments to their payloads. And so they could land on cliffs, they could land into skylights and be able to deploy uh, secondary systems. We've also come up with uh, even smaller balloons called Pico balloons. And, and this has been both popularized in the uh, hobbyist community, but we've also been uh, using this for technology demonstrations in science, but being able to send a swarm of them. And these use uh, almost party sized balloons uh, with helium or some kind of light gas. We've had uh, swarms that have been sent that can circumnavigate Earth in about two weeks by following the jet stream. And through that, we can get data uh, real time um, through the Whisper antenna system. And uh, this is a decentralized system that uses the, um, you know, the uh, much like shortwave technology um, to, to bounce that radio wave data through the atmosphere. But um, more is possible with, with really this type of technology and, and being able to sort of map the atmosphere and, and sort of watch its changes real time. Some of the other instruments, of course, are um, high resolution cameras that are you know, utilized on CubeSats or deep space CubeSats and, and potentially other uh, secondary instruments as well. One of our more intriguing things that we're looking at is, is using things like SphereX which is a, uh, our envisioning of using and incorporating smartphones into drone-like technology, but using them off-world. And how would they look? They would look like these basketball size systems between two and five kilograms each and uh, on board with 3D instruments and, and cameras that could be uh, deployed uh, from these uh, balloons and, and drop in and uh, make uh, great 3D maps and, and visualizations. And so they could be thrown into pits to explore and, and teams of these could be sent in to get 3D maps of a pit. Um, and, and furthermore, um, you know, figure out uh, really the evolution, the science uh, behind these, these structures. And, and with that, I'm gonna call up uh, Dr. Sergey, uh, who's gonna then uh, follow with talking about uh, the sailplanes. Thank you. Good morning. Yes, uh, 
Today, I would like to talk a little bit about our Mars sailplanes developments. And uh, definitely, you need to start from um, 90, uh, from 2021. Uh, NASA's Ingenuity Mars helicopter performed first flight on another planet. It was two minutes, as you well know. Uh, however, you, you also want at this point to reflect back and then remember that in 1903, Wright brothers did their first flight and it was one minute flight. So 120 years, two planets and endurance is, is that what it is. So uh, most of previous concepts Good enough. Good enough. All right. So most of the previous concepts for flight on other planets are based on, on powered vehicles and including propulsion system, electrical or chemical, would produce significantly more challenging uh, design, increase of mass, complexity. And, and that's why we decided, I really hate it. <laughs> I can talk without Mike, are, are you okay? You know. I'm doing, you know, this lectures without Mike. Yeah, take it. Is it better? Thank you. So to address the challenges of long dur duration flights, and we would like to fly there for hours and maybe days, uh, nature provides us with a, with a great inspiration in the form of albatross. And the secret of albatross flight is in the idea of you know, extracting energy from atmosphere through a very specific flight trajectories. This way, albatrosses are capable of flying again, hours and maybe days. We propose to utilize this idea of harvesting energy, atmospheric energy, and through the kind of soaring that should be optimal and should be provided as long in, longest endurance as possible. Uh, looking at the atmosphere it features, atmosphere features either here on Earth or on Mars, you can identify those um, pockets of either thermals, vertical updrafts, or planetary boundary layer in which the wind speed changes with altitude, creating gradients. You can look also in wind shears as potential energy source. Orographic winds, winds over the ridges, volcanoes, etc. And finally, jet streams. Those are sustained sources of energy, and they are available both on Earth and on Mars. And the picture here on the right, you see the map of winds at one kilometer altitude at Mars, and then we have quite a bit of winds there. So Conventional gliders here on Earth, they utilize most of the time thermals. And also we have much of energy that gliders can extract while flying around mountains or ridges. However, we look at, again, unusual unconventional stuff. We call it dynamic soaring techniques of flight that utilize gradients in, in the atmosphere, which is an atmospheric boundary layer. And if you look at the trajectory on, on this figure, and during windward climb and how altitude turn and leeward descent, energy can actually slightly increase. On the, on the fourth stage, in the low altitude turn, there will be loss of energy, but overall, when you do analysis, numerical analysis, simulations, 
you can prove and you can demonstrate that there will be either neutral or positive energy cycle during this orbit. We also look at the shear layers, either in the jet streams or back on the leeward side of the, of the mountain. And there we obtain similar results, similar positive results that prove that you can do uh, get much more of positive energy from atmosphere uh, compared to conventional thermals flight. Well, flight dynamics is, in that case, in an unsteady, um, unsteady winds, unsteady atmosphere, is complicated. However, with today's tools, we can solve the problem. We did analysis, we did simulations, and wind tunnel experiments to get with the best possible aerodynamic shape of the, of, this, of the glider. And these numerical simulations eventually resulted in the glider that potentially can fly on, uh, on Mars, taking into account fact of almost 100 times thinner atmosphere. However, we did make the step and prove that the flight possible in a steady state. The next one was to model uns unsteadiness of the of Mars atmosphere and to prove that this, uh, these unconventional techniques and flights are possible. Numerical simulations were conducted using Mars regional atmospheric modeling system that's developed by NASA. And we apply this these models, this modeling analysis to Alice Marineris area on Mars. And when you look at this nice plots over here, for example, this one based on the maps of winds in a vertical direction, thermals if you wish, showed quite a bit of magnitudes of the wind during, day, uh, during, during daytime and it drops during the night, Martian night. But we are lucky that the horizontal winds pick up and we have enough gradients there to fly it overnight using dynamic soaring techniques. We took an example mission and simulate an example mission in Wallis Marineris. And of course, the first stage of the flight will be a deployment and unfolding in the case of, for example, inflatable wings of the glider. And then we started our simulations along the uh, trace of the, of the Wallis Marineris. It's, it's a deepest canyon, seven kilometers depth. It's, it's huge. The land is from New York, like New York to, to San Francisco. And we start our modeling on one at one point of the of that canyon, take into account various possibilities. You start with a deep dive into the wind tunnel, pull up. You may lose some energy. However, from the ridge of the above, you can get shear layers and windward winds and shear layers that we utilize to prove that, in fact, you can get energy back, fly over the ridge, dive again, and with this type of flight, you can fly up to 200, kilom uh, two, two kilom uh, 200 kilometers during the day. And again, as, as I mentioned, on light, in addition to uh, minor, in this case, updrafts, we had some significant gradients in, in atmospheric boundary layer. You go down to the, to the bottom of the, um, of the of the body and, and fly there using utilizing uh, wind gradients in planetary boundary layer. If you look at the results, we did prove and we demonstrated, show that slope soaring and advancing slope soaring was available for us up to three hours. Canyon diving for hour, for oh, four hours, slope soaring another hour, and then gliding with the power on, we, we did kick off kick on the, uh, the motor from time to time, five hours. And finally, dynamic soaring took uh, 11 hours. So 24 hours, 40 minutes of flight can be achieved with this series of 
of trajectories that we know how to do. Well, the next question though, that was a proof on a paper, and we do know that may or may not be conven convenience uh, for, for all you know, people. And we try to, to do our next step, to prove the concept by utilizing Earth experiments and to prove the possibility and feasibility of fly on Mars. Again, look at the Earth, you have the same set of unsteadiness in atmosphere, thermal, sonographic winds, wind shear, planetary boundary layer, jet streams. We do design our autonomous glider for flight on, on the Earth and, and actually built it with control algorithms, realizing all the possibilities and varieties of the orbits. So the question remains how to prove that we have similar conditions. We would utilize similarity conditions of flow on Mars and Earth based on the Reynolds number and Mach number. And we come up with these two sets of parameters for the design of a vehicle, for the glider, sailplane on Mars with similarity on Earth. To fly on Earth, you have to go to 25,000 meters, 75,000 feet. To fly on Earth, the mass should be slightly lower. G is lower, wing area smaller, wind smaller. And eventually we have a glider of the shelf, 3.7 meter span that flies autonomously on earth. And if you bring it to 75,000 feet, it will realize conditions on Mars. Of course, we have an issue here, the issue of high flight altitude. It's a FAA issue. But we, about our students smart enough to conduct a lot of flights at 450 feet above the surface in Tucson. Hundreds of flights being conducted to prove that the technology works. And then we, we go to double crater north of Flagstaff. Here at 8,000 feet, you still cannot fly according to FAA but you can fly 450 feet above a ridge of the volcano. And that's what we've done. We did perform a lot of flights and they were successful and we collected data proving that technology works and autonomous flight in these conditions is possible. And another demonstration of that is short video. On the left, you see video camera footage view from the on board of the of the of the glider and on the right you have you see a flight trajectory and projection of that flight trajectory on the surface of crater we flew on the windward side with realizing there all kinds of shear layers techniques we go on the on the on the leeward side doing dynamic soaring there so and you see that from time to time we do need, we do need to, to get some energy from, uh, from the motor, which is in fact, can be utilized in both ways as a wind turbine when you have ex uh, extra energy uh, or as a power uh, source and propulsion source. Our next step is go further, go even higher still cannot go to 80,000 feet. But we found a, a good collaboration and help from Naval Postgraduate uh, School. They performed this annual event, four times actually, a year event called uh, Joint Interagency Field Experimentation, where you can fly 15,000. So, so we've been working now and trying to achieve this goal of 15,000 feet. For that, we will bring our glider to that altitude using weather balloon, release it there and let it fly. I will conclude with acknowledgements of hard work and then creativity of all our students. They're fantastic. And thank you very much. And I will, and we will answer questions. No. Hey, have you? Oh, 
Hey, have y'all got given any uh, thought to semi-rigid airships uh, combined with motors? We have, and uh, we've actually considered them as carriers for uh, these uh, sailplanes. Um, though, you know, given the size of our team and, and scope and resources, we haven't actually gone, you know, deep dive into, into their designs, but they're definitely very, um, they're another viable option as well. Hi. Um, I love the idea of sailplanes, but you have an atmosphere on Mars equivalent to being, say, 123,000 feet here on Earth. The, the, the winged vehicle must need to be with a very large wingspan and made of extremely light materials. Am I on the right track here? Absolutely. Yes. Yes, you're right. But you also will fly very fast. We will fly that at 70 meters per second, 210 feet, feet per second to take care about the density. Yes. Very interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm curious for autonomous operations on Mars, what kind of telemetry will you like real time telemetry will you need to optimize the flight path? And does that need like supporting sensors or supporting vehicles for that? Well, but so far we've been working with the Peaks Hawk autopilot, so fully autonomous. Uh, the the sensor suit includes um, G, well GPS, which will not work there. Uh, we we have the um, inertial measurement units. We have airspeeds. In addition to science sensors that also can be placed. Okay. Next, I would like to welcome Dr. William Bianco. He will be discussing Russia and the limits of global space cooperation. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so one of the focuses yesterday's, yesterday's discussion of policy was on architecture or hardware. How are we going to get there? And you know, my take, having listened to them, was that it's a really daunting task. There are really a lot of unknowns between here and there, uh, from propulsion to life support, even prosaic things like how do you deal with dust? And those are real, those are real issues. And uh, my hat goes off to anybody who's working on it. What I'm going to talk about is a slightly different problem today. And, and I'm a, a political scientist by trade. So hardware to me is endlessly fascinating, but what's also really interesting is the organizational structure. How do people learn how to work together? And, and I think it's in, sort of encapsulated in, in Werner von Braun saying, sure, we, can, we have to deal with gravity. Gravity is important, but what about the paperwork? What about the politics of things? And in particular, I wanna, I'm riffing and my title is, uh, the talk is from Carl Sagan's book, uh, should we go to Mars together? What does it matter? What difference does it make, whether it's one nation or many nations? What does cooperation mean? Not just whose flags are on the side or who gets to command or who steps on Mars first. 
It's about the agencies that will be forced to work together towards a common goal. How does that structure shape the particulars? And the, the overall lesson that I'm working towards here is that when we move from engineering to politics, there are new imperatives. Politics is not engineering by other means. The political system has its own unique impact on how we do things. And you've sort of seen this already. You know, I was uh, listening to the discussion about Mars sample return and how they're going to use electric propulsion to move the samples back from Mars. And, you know, Dr. Zubrin made an excellent point that there's a cost there. Why are you doing that? Well, and they said, well, basically, we got to launch on an Arian. And if we do that, we got to use electric propulsion. That's sort of the big hardware thing. And what I'm talking about here more is sort of the day-to-day -day imperatives that working together creates. And I'm using the ISS as kind of a canonical example of working together. You know, the ISS was designed, for better or worse, as a true partnership in the MOU that they signed to establish the station they talk about the doctrine of one station, one crew, that this was about a true partnership of equals, not a hierarchy. And, uh, you know, my own research, I've studied the ISS and talked to Russians and people from NASA, uh, ranging from astronauts to flight controllers to administrators, to try to get a sense of the ISS as an exemplar. If we're going to go to Mars together, truly together, as the ISS experience suggests, what does that mean? What do we have to watch out for? What are the lessons learned of the ISS for international cooperation? Now, I'll say on the outset that we are talking about this at a special time. I think it's pretty clear that under current circumstances, given Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the war crimes that are being committed there, we are not going to be working with Russia in anything beyond the bare necessities for a good long time. But the problem of cooperation, what does it mean to work together and what do you have to give up to work together? That problem is much larger and was omnipresent even before February of 2022. So why work together? Why should we take on partners to go to Mars? Well, one question, one, one answer is obvious. You send the best people. Uh, there's an easy intuition that expanding the pool gets you a better crew. And I think one of the interesting things I learned talking to astronauts was the respect they had for their Russian colleagues, not just as repairmen who can keep things operating under trying circumstances, but as pilots, as EVA specialists. And I think the, the, the line I got listening yesterday to a NASA flight surgeon, uh, Doug Hamilton, who's uh, at this conference, was he talked about the respect for operational, knowing how to do things, knowing how to get here from there, not the broad philosophical approaches or architecture, but the idea that Russians were exceedingly practical people. They're people you wanna have around. They have a deep sense of how to execute a long-term mission. So you want to send the best people. You want to send the best hardware. Um, if you take a look at how the ISS operates day to day, basic distinction. The US hardware is more capable. The Russian hardware is more robust. The US hardware is built with return and refurbishment in mind. Russian hardware was designed to be worked on in the field. The choice is not always obvious. There are plenty of situations, if you look at the ISS experience, where the US has saved the Russians or the Russians have saved us. But certainly by working together, you get combined different kinds of expertise and you get a better thing to go to Mars in. Why else? A commitment device. This is a picture of Clinton and Yeltsin signing the agreements that led to the ISS program. And in the simple intuition, and we heard this yesterday, was that international means that we aren't going to back out. And we're not going to back out because we don't want to renege on our partners. And, and speaking as a political scientist, I think the answer there is maybe. You know, the ISS endured many test votes in Congress where it barely squeaked through. And international was one of the rationales that we have committed to this. We need to stay in this. Now, honestly, I think we probably need a better reason to go to Mars 
than the fact that we've committed to going to Mars. But okay, this is an argument that's made. You know, final, why would you want to do this is money. Now, Greg Autry yesterday was talking about the relative sizes of space program budgets. And, and I'm thinking more in terms of purchasing power. You know, there's a theory that um, money isn't going to matter because Elon's going to take care of all our problems. And, and I suspect what's more likely the case is Elon is happy to build rockets, but he wants to get paid. It will be incredibly expensive to go to Mars, no matter how we do it. And having partners who can chip in from checks to rockets to whatever might well be essential. That's the argument for working together. So what does ISS teach us about the downside? What are the costs? All right, well, the first thing, elephant in the room, if you go with partners, you're a hostage to events. Friends may not stay friends. A decades long partnership means you are locked in. Now I know that at this very moment, there are people in NASA who are thinking really hard about how you take the ISS and undock the Russian segment and send it on its way. And that may be, will be possible. It's not easy. The two sides of the station, while they are largely separate, are integrated in ways that are very hard to divide. That said, I don't think there's any way you can separate Mars hardware. Once we go to Mars together, we are locked in. And one of the problems is, the people we go with may not be people we want to be with once we get there. Second, deeper problem, and I spent a lot of time talking to people about this. One of the problems with a partnership is that the parties demand continuous involvement. The partners just don't want flags on the side, and they don't want just a seat, a crew seat, to send one of theirs to Mars. The ISS partners all have domestic aerospace companies. They have mission controllers, they have scientists, and their participation in the enterprise is contingent on giving those people something to do, something to do for the entire duration of the mission. Their participation is contingent on addressing this need. And this notion of continuous involvement led to some pretty peculiar ways of operating the space station. Um, one, most obvious. This is a NASA chart of all the different organizations and locations that are involved, involved in managing the station day to day. And it's a very complicated structure. Uh, it's a management structure that makes no sense except in terms of satisfying the political imperative. Let me give you an example. The station day, when does the crew wake up? Station day begins at about midnight Houston time. And that means that the A team of station flight controllers how, are working the graveyard shift as a matter of routine. And they've been doing that for 20 years. And I've talked to them and it, it's an insane twist on their lives. Why do we do this? Well, the fact is that the way Roscosmos organizes its mission control, the specialists, the people who really know what's going on work business hours. And they kind of have to work business hours because a lot of them don't have cars. They use public transit. You can't have them coming in at odd hours. So what NASA conceded 20 odd years ago was that they would allow Russia to bring its A team in during their day shift and NASA would adapt. And that means mission control at Houston is most active in the middle of the night. So if you have a partnership, you're going to have all of these practical problems like time zones and language and language issues. Where are we going to have the core of station operations? And the answer is spread out everywhere. And that has been an incredible hardship and incredibly expensive for NASA. So a second problem, conflicting engineering judgments. I'm talking to NASA flight controllers. Um, one of the really interesting stories, sets of stories they would tell, 
is about learning that they were not always right. That even if they'd thought very hard about a problem, other people could arrive at a different answer. This is a picture of a progress docking in 2013. And um, the issue, the reason why there's this picture is one of the Kurz antennas is not deployed. It's uh, still stuck in next to the docking ring. And um, if you were listening to the ISS air to ground and following this docking, uh, you would find out that the NASA engineers were horrified about this. They, they said, wait a minute, we can't do this. That antenna stowed. When we dock, it might crunch against the docking ring and bad things could happen. And the Russians kind of talked about it for about 30 seconds. And they used that, that wonderful uh, Russian phrase, ladna, which sort of means whatever. And they, and they drove in. And, and the best part is that the, the Russian crew reports crunching sounds as the docking hooks engage. And, you know, it worked out okay. They, they docked and there weren't any leaks and, and no harm, no foul. Ladna. It was really a rude awakening to NASA that one of the, the core tenets of NASA is we've got this. We've worked it out. We've thought about it. We've bought the risks. Our solution is not just a good solution. It's the right solution. And here they found another program which was equally experienced, had thought about it equally, and came to diametrically opposed solutions. And dealing with that cognitive dissonance was and remains a big problem in managing a partnership, in managing a station. Now, the easy answer here, the easy answer is the Russians are risk acceptant and, and we're scaredy cats. And that's not quite right. Um, and I'll give you the example of satellite phones. Uh, every Soyuz carries a satellite phone. Uh, if they land off course, they can sort of call in and say, we're here, we're good, find us. And um, this is a, a US a Motorola satellite phone. And it turns out the Russians were incredibly paranoid about this phone because every few months you have to recharge it. And the Russians were concerned that the battery would explode into flames. And this is probably a comment on the Russian cell phone industry. So what the Russians mandated, NASA guys were like, I just plug it in, no big deal. Uh, what the Russians made them do is put it in a fireproof bag, seal it up, and only then plug it in. And so each side is paranoid about different things. Each side has risks they're willing to buy and risks that really scare them down to their core. And if you are in a partnership, you have to accept the fact that there are things you must care about that you would rather ignore. The essential lesson of the ISS and how you do cooperation is to stay out of the way. This is data that um, some students and I collected, and it uh, shows you the percentage of progress cargo that was for the US segment of the station. And the um, timeline is between September 2005 and, and March 2016. And what you see here is that there's a dramatic drop and it's just about when the Cargo Dragon began to fly. Cargo Dragon and Insignis now carry virtually all of the cargo for the US segment. Now, why would you do this? Because if you think about differential reliability and we would like to put some of our cargo on the progress and have them put some of theirs on our ships so that if a ship does it make it up to station? You have enough supplies. Well, the problem is if we're going to put cargo on the progress, it has to fit Russian standards. And here again, the Russians don't stuff everything in. They have their own ways of attaching cargo to the structure. You have to get the cargo to Baikonur. It turns out that putting all of that together is really hard. And the easy answer is, the Russians launched their cargo, we launched our cargo. And there's a very little amount of stuff that each side flies to the other, mostly last minute load stuff. And it's, it's really quite light, it's really inconsequential. But this insight about progress cargo is generic. A partnership is hard. Learning to work together is hard. The easiest way to cooperate is to stay out of the way. Don't work together. 
except when you really have to. And, and the interesting thing is that if you look at the literature on joint ventures, and this is a quote from uh, a fairly well-known business book called Up the Organization, so joint ventures are almost always bad. Joint ventures are likely joint failures. And that's because cooperation is not easy. Cooperation is not automatic. And the amazing thing about station, and this is what I came to after uh, following NASA engineers in Russia for a year. The amazing thing about ISS is that a bunch of engineers and flight controllers who are used to working in a very strict hierarchy where people know their place and know the chain of command found a way to make an impossible management structure work where they had to not only worry about their bosses and, and their official job description, they had to worry about these Russians on the other side who wanted very different things and were not in their management structure. They had to be negotiated with rather than ordered around. So if those are the constraints, if partnership is hard, what do we do? Well, it may be that NASA's learned this lesson. Um, I will point out to you, here's a picture of um, SpaceX lander on the moon, and there's only one flag on the lander. Artemis is very much a hierarchy, not a partnership of equals. NASA is emphatically in charge. Now, I know there are the Artemis Accords, but the Artemis Accords provide remarkably little insight to how we're going to fly these missions. If you look at what NASA is planning to do and how they're planning to do it, it is not a partnership anymore. Other people are free to sign on, they're free to send checks, and will fly their astronauts. But NASA is going to fly it largely as a NASA with others operation, not as a partnership of equals. But you know, Mars is not the moon. And an international, international cooperation may be a political imp imperative or a practical necessity. So if you have to cooperate, if you're gonna have to have a partnership to get to Mars, what should you keep in mind? Okay, the first thing that my work suggests is that the principles need an enduring role. They're not gonna wanna just send a check and get a C. Their participation can't be transitory it has to continue throughout the mission to give their experts something to do, to build the hardware, to train the astronauts, to manage the systems. And this is a picture of um, the second service module for Orion. And you know, I think people who look at this approach of having ESA build the Orion surface module, service module and say this, is, this approach is inefficient, that it costs a lot more, that the hassles of moving this hardware around are not trivial. Um, I think they're, they're totally right. They're missing the point. These sort of arrangements are not about optimizing the engineering. They are about optimizing the politics. And in this case, keeping ESA on board for station requires that we give them something to do. It requires that we assign a task to their aerospace industry, even though that decision probably creates more problems than it solves. Second thing, hatches divide responsibilities. The ISS lesson is that operational responsibilities need to end at module interfaces. You know, it said that the ISS design was a hack job that it was splicing together what was available, the Soviet Mir-2 and an American design that was largely over budget and delayed. And that's right. But what it was was a physical commitment to a different way of doing business, dividing responsibilities. The Russians have their side, we have our side. Solved a lot of problems on the ISS. It was probably the only way to do a true partnership. Third thing, agree to disagree. This is a screenshot of the Nauka module, module uh, docking with the ISS last summer. And if you might recall, that sent the ISS structure on a, a merry 360-degree turn. 
uh, and raise concerns about structural damage. Um, this intuition that NASA had that disagreements needed to be talked out, that technical interface meetings, splinters, working groups were the way to resolve differences. You are not going to resolve differences. The Russians were going to dock that module because they were convinced that was the right thing to do. And the fact that NASA thought it was a bad idea wasn't really relevant. They were going to do what they do. Now, we look, as the, we look by the way, as non-optimal to them as they do to us. You know, we might say, hey, wait a minute, you docked this thing with dodgy software, virtually no fuel, and an interface system that was never tested. And they say, sure, that's right. And your ammonia cooling system, if it ever springs a leak, is going to render the station non-habitable. We're both right. We have to agree to disagree if we're going to work together. So here's the lesson. Politics matters. We, and I'll put myself in this, like to reduce going to Mars as, as an engineering problem, to find the variables, do the trades, optimize. And I agree, it is an optimization problem, and it's a hell, hellish optimization problem. But there are more variables than engineers typically think about. Optimization for engineering and politics is going to look very different than a purely engineering approach would suggest. And um, I'd be happy to take any questions people have. Uh, first little comment, I think that uh, human history, if you zoom out far enough, is a history of uh, bigger and bigger teams of more and more diverse people uh, taking on uh, harder and harder challenges. So the fact that, uh, you know, we have uh, not learned to cooperate uh, at this level, that mean that that will never shut. So it is, it is still possible that that there is some learning to be done. Absolutely. Well, one of the I'll, I'll refer you to the work of Eleanor Ostrom, who did a lot of work on sort of self-organized teams arriving at ways to work together, and that's a very powerful mechanism. I mean, my point is a, is a is a more basic one, which is this is something we have to worry about. In addition to all the other things we need to worry about, we have to figure out how we're going to work together. That's probably something to think about in advance. Two seconds. Hi, um, I'm a great admirer of the ISS, but and when it's all ended, I mean, it, it's not literally attached to Earth, but very figuratively attached to Earth, and all the agreements and partnerships have to work for people to live there and work there. And I don't think you can apply that to Mars. And I think you've you've suggested that, but I'd like to get your political science perspective on whether or not getting to Mars can, can be a partnership. But once we're on Mars, all of the models from Earth don't really work anymore. And we have to figure it out all over whether or not Mars would be beholden to anybody on Earth or any company or institution or National Space Agency. Or do we start all over, declare Mars a sovereign place and um, go from there? I'm really interested in your take as a political scientist. That's a really that's a good question. I would go to, again, the work of Ostrom which talks about how the governance of small groups, self-governance is a, is a really effective mechanism. And it works best when you have small groups who are utterly dependent on each other and isolated from everywhere else, which is what Mars looks like to a first approximation. Um, that's where I'd go. I think the, the arguments about, well, we need a constitution for Mars, we need a legislature, sort of a, a Kim Stanley Robinson approach. I think that's the wrong, that's the wrong experience. What's going to happen on Mars is going to look much more like what happens in the absence of a state rather than the imposition of a state. That's that's a bit of a guess, but that's that's where I'd start looking. 
Hi, um, I'm Stuart Nelson. Have you looked at how the open source software community manages it? Because they they have international cooperation is just as a, I mean, I don't think they even think about it as international cooperation, but there are people all over the world working on these projects and they do major, you know, major work. Have you looked at that? Yeah, that that, that, is, that is a good model of what would happen in the absence of central authority. I think right now in terms of what we do once we get to Mars, that's an interesting question. But for the moment, I think getting to Mars is going to be an enterprise of nation states, of existing organizations, different situation. Thank, thank you for the presentation. Um, I guess it's a, a question of the going alone versus going together. They're, they're solving different problems. Uh, if your problem is building another space station that has longevity of political support, you know, the, the ISS model uh, has kept it going for over 20 years. Maybe. Um, when you look at a project like Apollo or, or Artemis, where it's much, I mean, very, very much focused, you know, on Apollo on how do we get there? We don't know. We've spent 15 minutes in space, but even returning with Artemis, where there's much more of a, a technical challenge, a budget challenge, um, you see the more go alone approach. I, you know, thinking of the the technical and challenges of of going to Mars and and establishing bases there. How do you weigh the the, the go you know go alone go fast versus the take way longer and more expensive but have longer political commitment trade off between those two? That's a, that's a really good question. I mean, the thing of it is really major space programs, we have a fairly low end and we have Apollo, which was done in an incredibly competitive way. And then we have ISS, which was done in a more collaborative way. It seems to me that the collaborative, those choices, do we work together? Do we work alone? We're not about the engineering so much as the different politics of the situation. Now, Artemis so far harkens back to Apollo. It's not obvious to me that a Mars expedition, which would be much more expensive, would be something that one nation would want to do by itself. And, and maybe it would. It's certainly possible. But what I'm suggesting is if you go together, there are reasons why you'd want to do that. But in going together, you buy an additional set of constraints, and it's worth thinking about how you'd accommodate them. It would look very different if you work together than if you work alone. Which one would you like to do? How much money you got? That's the question. Okay, um, Robert Suprin. Um, okay, uh, by the way, just briefly, it's not my main point. Uh, a Mars mission would not necessarily be much more expensive than Artemis. Uh, a well done uh, Art uh, Mars mission or a well-done moon mission would be much less expensive. I'm familiar with the argument. Okay, but that's not what I really want to talk about. Um, the most important and the most successful example of international cooperation in history is the Allied war effort in World War II, um, and which encompassed about 25 nations. Uh, and of course, the big three being the United States, the British Empire, and the Soviets. Um, in that context, I would actually say the Soviets were not allies, they were co-belligerents. We shared a common enemy, yes. we did not share a common cause. But the United States and the British Empire really were allies, okay? And there were other people that were involved that were allies as well. We, we shared a, 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 a not just a common enemy, but a common cause, a common vision of the world we wanted to create. And, uh, and this was done, I mean, it, it provides a convenient model um, because there certainly were major differences between the US and the British. Uh, and we accommodated them uh, fairly uh, efficiently. We didn't have ships that were crewed by Brits and Americans. We had Brits. British ships and American ships sailing in the same task force. And in some cases, they were commanded by British admirals. And in some cases, they were commanded by American 
American admirals. And we had American divisions and British divisions, okay? And they sometimes engaged in common operations, but we didn't have mixed divisions. Uh, the only enterprise in which there was actually a mixture of personnel of any significance was the Manhattan Project. Okay. Yes. Uh, but that was American run, but there was significant British participation. So why can't that be the right model for international cooperation uh, to go to Mars? Bring your own ship. Okay. Then if, you know, uh, Japan drops out of the mission or Italy or someone, uh, we still have all the other ships. Uh, rather than, you see, I, I think the ISS model is incredibly flawed of, of making a common a mechanism dependent on all the contributors staying on board. Well, yes. Uh, one Russian engineer described the ISS uh, to me as a bulldog mated to a rhinoceros. Uh, <laughs> And it's 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 a fair it's a fair cop. Um, the other thing I think about World War II was the care with which people like Eisenhower allocated responsibilities, managed control of things, and and agreed to disagree. So the Brits did night bombing and we did day bombing because they couldn't come to a common idea of how to manage the enterprise. They went for uh, something NASA talks about in really disparaging terms, segmented operations. You do your thing, we do our thing, it moves in the same direction. Now you're right, separate ships is not a bad approach if you can afford it. I think NASA put the ISS together as an act of desperation, as Hail Mary. They were about to get canceled. And by bringing the Russians in, they kept the station alive. We may wind up doing the same thing going to Mars. And my point is that that has certain implications. There are better ways to operate a partnership than others. And I'd agree with you. The ISS partnership has some real issues. And if we did it now, we'd do it differently. That's the point. Uh, I've done it. Maria and Maya, can you give us a quick sound check, please? Um, am I audible? Yes. Um, am I audible? Yes, thank you so much. Hello. Okay. So um, we're now going to have the first of uh, actually five discussions, two here and then three more in the afternoon, about the uh, re remarkable uh, international uh, uh, high school Mars mission engineering design competition. Um, this was uh, uh, a unique enterprise, uh, the which I I thought of, and actually I thought of it years ago, um, but we only finally just did it. Uh, I was actually a high school teacher before I became an engineer, and so I went back to graduate school. I became an engineer, where I encountered a phenomenon uh, known as the engineering design class. Um, which is a very different kind of class than most university classes and which I had not encountered in my undergraduate education at all. Uh, and that's where the whole class works together as a team to design something. And I mean, let's say if you're in aerospace, it's a fighter aircraft and you have to maximize a whole bunch of competing variables, speed, altitude, range, weaponry, cost, uh, uh, strength, these all things, uh, if you try to do one right, you hurt the others. Um, and then sometimes different design classes compete against each other. And this was, it's incredible um, what it does. It reverses the relationship of the student to knowledge. Instead of knowledge being a burden, how much of this do we need to know for the test? It, knowledge becomes 
uh, a tool. Uh, you know, what is the answer? There's got to be a better way to design this. And the, the, so when this hit me in, in, as a grad student back in the uh, 80s, I said, this would be a great way to teach high school. And well, this summer we decided to do it. We organized an international competition. Now it was all done by Zoom, um, but we took, you know, anyone could volunteer. And then we organized them into teams, uh, one in Asia, one in Europe and the Middle East, uh, and three in North America, more or less organized according to time zones. Um, and what you see here are uh, most of the members of the winning team, which is from Asia. Uh, and um, the, 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 the contest included not only listening to a bunch of lectures of experts on Mars missions and technologies, who we did not attempt to get to agree with each other because in the real world, they don't. Um, the students had to sort them out to figure out who they wanted to listen to, and then do their designs and write them up and present their designs. And then we gave each team a half hour to tear apart the designs of the other teams. And then a half hour each to refute the attacks on their designs, okay? And the latter two uh, aspects are not ordinarily done in university engineering design competitions. This was new uh, and it worked out well. So that's what happened. So we're gonna hear from the, the winning team. They're gonna show you their design now. Then we're gonna have a panel in which they'll have a representative and we'll also have representatives from each uh, of most of the other teams. I can see the Western Americans here and I know the Europeans are here and uh, I believe the Eastern North Americans are here somewhere. We'll have them up here. And then in the afternoon in some of the tracks, uh, some of those teams um, will present their designs as well. Uh, we, the Mars Society, uh, this was an enormous success. The quality of the work, as you will see, was university level. And the, and, and I, we're going to take this why to, to try to make this part of curriculum. We're going to attempt to reform education, okay, using this methodology. So without further ado, I give you New Era, the team from Asia, which won the contest. <laughs> United States, United States. Team, one. team one. Eastern, Eastern. Yeah. Oh. No, you're not. You're, it's just you. Yeah. Yeah. No, hello. Uh, no. I don't think so. Oh. And maybe. Well, just chill. Sorry about that. Good. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Enjoying this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, good day, everyone. I am Carl Logic Gear from the Philippines, and I'm with the rest of my team here from the USA, Singapore, and joining us virtually would be from India, and it's all our honor to present our project for a new era of Mars exploration using the technology of our decade. So as an overview, new era is an acronym for the different components of our mission. We have the name Nourish, which is fittingly for the greenhouse, enjoy for the habitat, wonder for the spacesuits, explore for the rover, the balloon named Reach, there's also uh, the truck name Achieve. As much as we need this equipment, we chose these names because we also believe we need to remind ourselves of what we have to do in order to pioneer a human mission to Mars. So the new era mission is uh, divided into three main objectives. Is There we go. Three main objectives under atmosphere and weather we're interested in the planet's methane distribution. And under life on Mars, we're 
experimenting on growing plants using hydroponics and also searching for life nearby ice. And lastly, under human sustainability, we're aiming to have both short and long-term survival on the planet. In alignment with the mission objectives, Utopia Planitia was chosen, first of all, for its geological features like volcanoes, lava pools, and the like. And these could potentially have life in them. And second, Mars reconnaissance has actually confirmed ice on the surface of Utopia. And if not at the surface, it's just right below it. And this makes uh, water extraction more accessible for the crew in the planet. And lastly, Utopia is only 45 kilometers away from a crater in Amazonas Tunisia, which is of interest to us because of our objective regarding atmosphere and weather. And about that, I would like to talk about uh, Curiosity's Curious Finding in 2014, which Dr. Albert actually briefly mentioned earlier in his presentation. And this is unusual because uh, we found a tenfold increase in atmospheric methane. And the problem is that the source of the methane is unclear, especially we have no confirmed evidence of methanogens on Mars. And of course, there could be non-biological processes like water rock reactions. And an interesting hypothesis that caught our attention in particular is uh, that to some extent, dust devils might be involved in distributing the methane unevenly. And so our experiment is looking into how colliding dust particles create electrical discharges and how these electrical discharges in turn trigger a series of chemical reactions that eventually destroy the methane on Mars. And uh, if this is proven, then this might give us an answer to why we are seeing lower levels of methane on some areas of Mars, but in some areas it peaks to uh, unusual levels, like what Curiosity found last 2014. And to understand this, Team New Era has a two-part experiment, uh, one with a balloon monitoring from above and one with a rover ex examining the rocks on the ground. And I'm glad Dr. Uh, Jack Han uh, already explored how cool Mars balloons are. And yeah, they're using it for clips and now we're using it for atmospheric monitors. And the real uh, meat here is the commercially available hypercam methane, which visualizes methane in real time and the Agile Digital Detector or ADD, which looks for electrical discharges that might be destroying the methane. And the ADD is already developed by the University of Michigan and bringing one of them to Mars will give scientists a better view of smaller scale atmospheric events that might be invisible here at Theonos. And that's an overview of the balloon. And now I'm passing the mic to Vibhav who'll discuss the second part of the experiment, which is the rover. Work. All right. Uh, sorry about that. So, so for the explore part of the new era mission, we're going to be focusing on the geology and the search for life on Mars using our specialized rover, conveniently named Explore. Since we are extracting ice for methane, water, and oxygen production, we will be vetting all of our dig sites for life using the rover. Now, if we're looking for life, we must be prepared for the scenario that we actually find it. Well, seven high schoolers aren't exactly the most qualified people to figure out what to do with the first life on another planet. So we've designed our mission to pause for three months while mission control figures out what to do. But even in this situation, our scientific exploration of Mars will not stop as our unmanned balloon and the rover will still be able to continue. If we do not find life on Mars, we're going to continue with our ice extraction plan. The Explore rover is designed to be remotely controlled by Martian astronauts and is fully powered on solar. It is able to drill into the ground, not only to look for ice and do geologic research, but also on-site analysis and sample collection so the crew can streamline their exploration process. And on the screen there, you can see my very crude design of what this rover might look like. 
Now, this rover carries up to 50 pounds in samples, extracted using a one meter long auger drill that is built to be rotary percussive. So this rover is able to hammer through the rocks on Mars. Using a process called biting, which you can see in the top left of the screen there, we're going to slowly work our way in and out of our dig site to avoid getting stuck and use a temperature sensor on the end of the drill bit to learn more about the subsurface temperatures on Mars. An electrode also on the bit will be used to find the solubility of ice on Mars, making sure that drilling is done as efficiently as possible without getting the drill stuck. Once a sample is out of the ground, we're going to be using a pneumatic tube system to bring back all of our samples from the front to the back of the rover, just because this is the most mechanically easy to do and avoids contamination of all of our samples. Now that we have all of our samples, let's analyze them. The rover has three chemical analysis systems present on it. The first form is called solid, the sign of life detector. This uses two main parts to look for Earth-like life, uh, searching for the repeating polymers that Dr. Benner has told us to watch out for. The second system is called the Microfluidic Life Analyzer, or MILA. This is designed to test for 500 plus different biological compounds, including organic molecules and amino acids from small liquid samples. Finally, the rover is equipped with a mini mass spectrometer. Together, these tools will give the crew a holistic look of the composition of where they're digging and allow them to quickly and carefully determine what needs further exploration, whether it be for biological or geologic interests. This system will be first used to analyze the ice on Mars and then move on to other sites as the crew sees fit. The rover is also built on the methane detection goals of the RISE balloon. This methane detection system is going to be attached to the bottom back of the rover and is going to dig into the ground using a laser to look for methane deposits. So this is going to be basically secondary to the methane detection system on the balloon, so our crew can get a holistic view of the methane distribution on Mars. There are three main forms of communication on the rover, the low gain, high gain, and ultra high frequency antennas. These allow the rover to communicate directly to the HAB through orbiters, direct radio control, and even all the way back to Earth mission control if needed respectively. These systems will allow communication with the rover uh, and prevent it from being lost. Uh, the final important part of this rover is the spring tires. Uh, the spring tires haven't actually been used on Mars yet, but they're very important to our mission because as you can see on that bottom picture there, they're malleable, but they're still able to go back to their former shape once that rock is removed. These tires are gonna allow us to go into craters and not worry about getting stuck, making our rover not only more efficient in transit speed compared to say Curiosity and Perseverance, but less likely to break down as well. Although this rover is separately designed from NASA's rovers, it still uses the same principles and technology of many of, of, many of its ancestors. All the communication systems are taken directly from Curiosity and Perseverance. The methane detection systems and life detection systems are derived from previous NASA projects. And although not all of them are tested on Mars, many of them are designed for future Mars missions. Even the newest aspects of the rover, like the drill and connected geological tools, are designed for a Mars mission and are built to avoid the previous downfalls of the InSight lander. Uh, with the ice location confirmed, no life detected, and plenty of samples for the crew, Explore returns to base as the next part of the ice extraction process begins, which Brian will now talk about. Hello, I'm Brian Reitkirk, and it was my responsibility to design the pressurized manned vehicle named Achieve. It was taken from inspiration from the NASA Chariot Lunar Rover concept. So, can we please change the slide? The intended purpose for Achieve is to provide a modular platform that can be configured to the needs of the crew to necessitate the drilling of ice for potable water or for the exploration of the Martian landscape of Utopia Plantia and the surrounding areas of interest. The pressurized cabin module is essentially a pressurized shipping container that can house foreign bunks, contains two airlocks for the spacesuits, and a small lab table to conduct simple experiments on. The drilling module has a large crane arm with a large tungsten <laughs> with a large tungsten carbide corkscrew drill, similar in concept to hand drills used for ice fishing in the Arctic. This drill is supposed to supply an estimated 1,600 liters of water per day for the crew to use as potable water, or for separating it for use in the production of methane for heating and powering the hab. The water filtration system departs from departs from traditional filters, like those used in reverse osmosis, and instead utilizes evaporation to separate the water from contaminants. 
Due to the low gravity on Mars and with electrolysis being ever more efficient in higher gravity, we can use centrifuges to simulate higher gravity and thus increase the efficiency of the whole system. In order to keep the design simple, the system must be periodically halted to refill the tanks and for maintenance. The methane production system creates methane for heating and power for the main hab by pressurizing diatomic hydrogen taken from electrolysis and carbon dioxide from the Martian atmospheres and combining them at about three atmospheres and at a temperature of 400 degrees Celsius to create methane in the presence of a nickel catalyst. The byproduct, conveniently being water, will be separated and placed in the centrifuge to continue the cycle. The methane produced will be used as fuel not only for powering the hab, but also heating the main hab in greenhouse. Heating can be regulated by how much steam and CO2 produced by the combustion of methane is allowed to flow through the ventilation of the hab, as none of the gases will be introduced to the hab's atmosphere, and should the regulatory system fail and all the heated gas escape into Martian atmosphere, the astronaut should not be in any real danger of decompression. Also, due to the inherent need of large amounts of gaseous products for methane production and life support, we have quickly identified the need to have large amounts of pressurized gas on hand. This was easily solved as we can safely store large amounts of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen so they are accessible and not any danger to the crew. The simplest solution we have is to cryogenically store the gases as it is the most efficient way to store the gases in a usable manner outside the HAB. Now, on to the HAB. Hi. Hi everyone, my name is Vashti Chawla and um, I'll be talking about the HAB. So as our favorite Martian has demonstrated with his extensive renovations to his own habitat, the HAB must be able to sustain itself through uh, many changes. And so um, I'll talk about our aptly named habitat uh, named Endure. So our Endure habitat will require about 75 kilowatts to 90 kilowatts of power to operate per day. The structure itself will be modular and each module will serve a different purpose as shown by the diagrams on our screen. The central living module will be surrounded by uh, other modules serving specific functions. Um, and these modules will all be separated by airlocks to allow separate uh, temperature and air regulation as well as to prevent cross contamination between the modules. Um, our indoor habitat will be made up of 3D printed su superstructures printed with Martian regolith by rovers sent up to the surface prior to the mission start date. The regolith is a very promising material as not only is it of course abundant on Mars, but it also serves as a layer of protection at, from solar and cosmic radiation. Beneath this, we have chosen to have an inflatable layer made from about 980 square meters of uh, high density polythene, which has a higher strength to weight ratio, lower mass and increased damage tolerance due to its flexibility. So the habitat will provide protection from extreme temperatures, high energy radiation, solar storms, and dust devils. As the habitat is also made of layers, as I mentioned, we are keeping them separated by around five millimeters to facilitate more efficient heat transportation. And now, of course, anywhere humans settle will require thought into a disposal planning system, however much we may not want to think about that. On Mars, this is especially important as we do not want to contaminate our site with human waste as this will be the Marsonauts homes for one and a half years. What is equally crucial is that we do not contaminate Mars itself with our human waste as this could hinder our ability to study it. Um, so disposal can be split up into four main areas, human waste, packaging, clothing, and spare or broken parts. The toilets will uh, resemble NASA's universal waste management system and will be made of metallic enclosures such as from titanium. They will have vacuum ability to ensure minimal use of water and also to help segregate the waste. Then a heat melt compactor reactor will process this waste to produce water, oxygen, and other gases. The remaining waste will be biologically inactive and can be disinfected using ammonia and feces will be used in the greenhouse as well as made into trash disks to be used in the HAB structure. In our urine processor, the urea will be collected and directed to the greenhouse where it can be used as fertilizer. Now, during EVAs, the Marzonauts will use maximum absorbency garments and dispose of them to be subsequently stored in the storage module of our habitat. However, with the emergence of more sustainable solutions to historically disposable ones, by degree, Biodegradable garments like those made by the comp company Unique Wellness can be um, burned with no adver adverse effects and used as fuel on Mars. So in future missions, the equipment could be taken to disinfect these garments and turn the waste into usable compost. 
Um, lastly, packing for such a long mission will take up at least a ton of the weight on the payload. In cases of machinery, plastic packaging can't really be avoided. But for certain food and other matter, lightweight materials such as bamboo, cornstarch, or mycelium could be used. We also have devised a system through which the Marzonauts can get optimal use out of their clothing. Sorry, can you go on the next slide, please? Yeah, so we will be using um, liquid carbon dioxide um, dry cleaning, and this ensures uh, use of minimal water so as not to use up the precious uh, water source of our Marzonauts. And lastly, we've ensured efficient, uh, sorry, sufficient backup for every important system. Uh, but if a device stops functioning beyond repair, we can repurpose its parts for use elsewhere. I will now pass on to my colleague Venkata to talk about our Wonder spacesuits. All right, hello everyone. My name is Venkata Burgabanda. Um, I'll be explaining to you the design, function, and other aspects of our Wonder spacesuits. This is the uh, W in the New Era acronym. So these spacesuits are specifically designed for a manned mission to Mars, and they're optimized for uh, efficiency and accessibility. Their primary functions will include protecting the Marzonauts from the Martian atmosphere and radiation, and providing increased dexterity and comfort compared to previous designs. So the layers of the suit itself are pretty conventional. The outer layer will be made of orthofabric, and areas that are likely to undergo additional wear and tear, such as the knees and elbows, will be covered with Teflon, uh, which is very slick and hence harder to catch and damage easily. The gloves will be made of traditional Vectran uh, with a layer of Tyvek underneath for further protection of the hands. Um, the new era mission plans to provide seven of both IVA and EVA suits. So the suits will be covered with the blue Maya coating uh, because this color helps uh, reduce radiation exposure, but primarily because it stands out very well in the Martian environment. So in addition to this, it's also uh, resistant to light, corrosion, fading, and moderate heat. Uh, for the helmet and visor, we'll have polycarbonate as it bends when force is applied rather than breaking, retaining good optical properties. Uh, to protect the Marzonauts' eyes, the helmet will be covered in a thin gold film to reflect ultraviolet and infrared light, but it'll still let visible light pass through. Okay, so now we have the design of the Wonder spacesuits. As many of you know, there are two major systems of maintaining pressure on the human body, which are gas pressurization and mechanical counter pressurization. Um, until now, all of the suits that have been used are gas pressurized, um, but MCP suits, which use skin tight garments to provide pressure against the skin, have been uh, largely uh, ignored. So, to use aspects of both mechanisms, we propose a design in which the suits would be made of an outer gas pressurized layer, but also an inner mechanical counter pressure layer. So, this way, the Wonder spacesuits are safer through redundancy, uh, increase mobility for the astronauts, and reduce weight on the astronauts for uh, easier EVAs. So, of course, the helmet would still be gas pressurized, um, but a neck dam would separate the GP helmet from the GP MCP lower body. Um, also, as an ISRU application, uh, the spacesuits will keep pumping stored oxygen into the helmet, but they'll pump the Martian atmosphere into the upper and lower torsos. So, the pre breather requirement for the Mars knots would still be about 30 minutes. Um, uh, as Vashti said, the waste management and maintenance systems on the spacesuit will probably be maximum absorbency garments and to collect urine and feces for the duration of the EVAs. Um, in total, the combined suit weight would come out to be about 217.75 pounds on Mars, which is around 82 pounds on, oh, on Mars, sorry. Um, yeah, so for communication during target excursions, the crew will use built-in ham radios in the headgear of the spacesuit. Uh, the beacons for these radios will be placed in our truck in the hat so that they're supportable as well as a stationary beacon. And these will have like a 150 to 200 meter radius. So uh, we'll also have a high gain antenna set up to contact Earth through the Mars Endeavour satellite. And the signals will be converted to and from binary during travel. So now I'll pass it on to my colleague Arya to talk about food and the greenhouse. Thank you, Ankita. Um, hello everyone, I'm Arya Ozadeh and I'm going to talk about Nourish, which is the name of our greenhouse and it does exactly what its name means. So the system of growing food in the new era mission is hydroponics. Aeroponics was not chosen as it's a lot less reliable than hydroponics and if something were to happen to the plants, like maybe something gets contaminated or nutrition isn't supplied enough, the plants are likely to die a lot faster than plants grown hydroponically. On the other hand, 
aquaponics and aeroponics are good options for future missions, as by that point it will be a lot more self-sustainable and it would be more risk-free. Risk uh, we've got a wide variety of food items to grow, including potatoes, sweet potatoes, carrots, lentils, tomatoes, spinach, soybeans, rocket leaves, and white mushrooms. Mushrooms will be grown separately from the rest of the crops in a cooler, darker environment. The mycelium required to grow the mushrooms will be grown in the laboratory. And each harvest is going to be around 95,000 to uh, 100,000 calories weekly. And the plants will be supplied with artificial light. Now, this is the nutrient table. A wide variety of plants have been chosen to avoid many fatigue and have been chosen according to the crew's nutrient requirements. Next slide, please. Food. Pre-packed food is going to be carried and consumed until the crop harvest is ready. We also have luxury foods and personal comfort foods that the crew can eat if they're suffering from any fatigue or during times of uh, celebration. Lastly, uh, this supplementary uh, pre-packed food has a shelf life of, of around four years, so it can last them throughout the entire trip. Mushrooms. Mushroom growth will start after the first harvest, after the mycelium has been grown in the laboratory. Unconsumed plant material like husks of lentils or leaves we don't eat will be stored and used to support the mushroom growth. Uh, the mushrooms will also be high in protein and potassium. Fertilization. The plants are going to be fertilized using urine and human feces. Urine containing high amounts of, uh, it contains high amounts of nitrogen, which uh, when mixed with water fertilizes the plants. Human feces contains high amounts of phosphorus and potassium, and uh, the feces and urine together are essentially complementing each other as one provides an essential nutrient that the other cannot. Um, our main goal in this case is to make the most out of uh, the waste products. Um, majority of the biochemistry research relating to food in the newer emission includes uh, studying plant growth, nutrient content, environmental conditions, temperature, and pH balance. The mycelium used to grow the mushrooms will also be closely studied. Additionally, human waste will be examined regularly to check for any abnormalities. Water management and water cycle. The urine could go two ways. It could go into a urine processor to be, to be decontaminated and converted to urea to use directly in the hydroponic system, or it could just directly be put into it. Any excess urine can be recycled as water. Feces can go two ways as well. It could go into the heat milk compactor, which could be used as fertilizer for the mushrooms and put into the composting box, or could be used as food as a last resort or during emergencies. Now to my dear colleague, Maya, who's going to talk about the newer crew. Um, hi, I'm Maya, and I'm going to be speaking to you about our new era crew. Carl, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, firstly, we have our selection process, which will consist of several elimination stages, similar to what the ESA and NASA currently follow. The final round will have 10 shortlisted candidates, as you can see on the slide, out of which the five that make the original crew will be chosen based on their abilities to work as a team. The crew will be selected based on an age and height range, as well as their experience and qualifications, and will hopefully be chosen in a manner as representative and diverse as possible. We've chosen these specific ranges and base criteria, keeping in mind various types of limitations. The crew should, the crew should ideally consist of people that are psychologists, doctors, engineers, climatologists, and chemists. As you can see, we've detailed in the slide. To maximize the work that the crew can do on Mars, the preparation should include training in mechanical skills, such as AI and coding, in case any hardware needs manual repair on Mars, as well as establishing ways of being pragmatic and adjusting conflicts within the team. The crew's physical health will be highly impacted due to the lack of fresh food and high amounts of radiation on Mars, and the impact of this can only be reduced by the dietary conditioning that the crew practices during their training, as well as being consistent with their calorie and water intake every day. A crew member's soul should consist of about two hours of physical exercise every day. Um, equipment such as the arid and drawing machine will be part of the payload so that the crew can perform strengthening and cardio exercises on a daily basis. The mental health effects that the crew is going to face will include uh, things like decline in brain function, development of sleep disorders, and increased conflicts with each other that will definitely affect their performance and the overall mission. The impact of this can hopefully be reduced by maintaining personal, a personal log, spending some alone time every day, and performing breathing practices that might help them keep um, a calm mind. 
Medical protocol would include the astronauts receiving spontaneous spasms or results during the day so that they receive stimulus um, on, on a daily basis. Autonomous, uh, Carl, could you put the next slide, please? Autonomous medical care will be required during the mission, which is why medical training will be extremely intense. Different types of testing, as you can see up on the slide, will be, have to be carried out at intervals during the mission. The crew will be monitored at all times by a monitoring watch and strip that will gather and transmit the data on their vitals. Um, the butterfly IQ device on the right is a holdable portable device that could be used to perform ultrasounds. The crew will have access to an SOS medical website on every available device in case of any immediate advice or help that they require. And each crew member will also have their own first aid kit and the main medical supply will be in the medical module. A crew member's day will look something like this, with sleep time and work time being about equal. Physical exercise and mental exercise will consist of about three to four hours of their day, and the rest should be recuperation time. The daily water intake should be around two and a half liters, while daily, daily calorie intake should be around 3,000 calories. This is a more detailed table of what a soul will be like for a crew member. Um, a crew member should ideally adapt habits like taking their waking heart rate, as that will help them, as well as people on Earth, to understand how their body is recovering. The crew should ideally schedule some weekly movie watching time or music listening time together to maintain the team environment. And testing such as urine and blood tests should be performed at least once in two weeks, as well as hab swabbing and machinery checks. We believe that the crew should still clock 10 to 12 hours of astronaut training to help them keep in touch with mission objectives, considering this is such a long mission. Although when the crew starts, this depends on the factors of the, of the mission. They would have enough training to know what they're doing, but to maintain spatial and muscle memory, these minimal hours of revision is required. At least five to six cleaning days should be assigned in a month and move on a rotatory basis with each astronaut being in charge of one day. It's also extremely important that each astronaut receives at least one day off per month if they can afford it. And this is what the 18-month schedule of the NIRA crew looks like, with rover activity and drill and balloon research being spread through the months, while the initial months consist of setting up the central and facility modules. I'll now um, hand it over to my teammates in Arizona. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. I know we went a little bit over what we were supposed to, but we just wanted to quickly say Thank you for such an amazing opportunity. Having the ability for any of you to listen to us, even just for a second, as high schoolers is just a feeling we can't really put into words. Um, we're in the front seat for a new era, both in science and society, and we're so happy that we were able to be a small part of that by being here. Thank you to Dr. Zubrin and Mr. Burke for organizing this event. And thank you to our mentors, Dr. Brian White and Ms. Ashwani Ramesh, our mentors. Thank you. Thank you, Maya and Arya. This is slightly more short. I'll go for two. No, I know. It's kind of just one. Hello. Okay, so we're now going to have a panel on this competition. And uh, so we're keeping one of the members of the Asia team on, but I'd like a representative from each of the other teams that are here. So, for example, uh, a representative from the um, Western American team. Uh, uh, I know Eastern Americans, uh, European team. Um, uh, so, 
Okay. So I know you're from the East Coast American team uh, and you're from the European team and then you're from the Western American team? Yes. Okay, great. And then uh, Trudy, uh, who was not part of this contest, but was um, very much involved in uh, STEM and space education um, and, and was a judge of the con, excuse me. Okay, she was one of the judges, which are very important. Okay, because it's not just the people who cast the votes, it's the people that count the votes that count too quote Stalin, but anyway. <laughs> um, in any case, um, so um, yes, and, and you should know, by the way, uh, that while the Asian team won in uh, overall, and they also won in, uh, there were four categories of merit that each got points, uh, they also won in the human factors category. Uh, the uh, Western American team here, as I recall, won in the engineering class, but did not win overall. They had the best engineering score. The Eastern Americans uh, won in the science program. Um, and I should add, by the way, that the science programs of all of these uh, mission designs was better than that of the NASA design reference mission. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> because 30 of the 100 points was for designing the science program that the mission would actually accomplish. So it was a serious matter for them, whereas in the NASA mission, it's an afterthought. Uh, so the um, uh, East Coast Americans uh, won uh, the science, although I, I should say they just nosed out the Europeans who came close. And uh, the Europeans did win on cost. So the uh, each of the four teams here uh, excelled in at least one of, of the categories of merit. Um, so I already explained what the contest was like. And so I, I'd like to ask uh, the contestants, uh, you know, what was uh, your impression of the experience? Um, does any one of you young people want to take this? Um, on? Okay. Is this on? Yes, it is. Um, I'd say that more than anything, it gave us a good snapshot of what engineering classes, um, what scientific studies might look like in the future for us. Um, and as high schoolers, being able to get that window into what life at a university might be like and what life in our future careers may be like, um, that was one of the bigger um, that's one of the more bigger picture things, but I just love the formation of teams and how we kind of just got thrown together based on location, but we ended up creating friendships, at least I hope you guys created friendships, and it was an amazing time, um, both in terms of actually getting down to business and just hanging out like my team and I have been doing. Okay, another one want to comment on it? I learned a lot about the research process in this competition. I learned all about, you know, um, how to work together as a team, uh, conduct meetings, you know, coordinate timings and stuff. I also learned a lot about um, the, the writing process, you know, the writing of the reports, the citings, how to properly cite and, just a lot about the design process, you know, like all the different designs we had and, you know, how to finalize that design into what our final mission plan was. I thought it was a really interesting experience. It's a opportunity that I'm super grateful for. So for me, um, apart from just getting to know more about Mars uh, itself and uh, uh, like you mentioned, the, the writing the report. Also, it was a great opportunity to uh, practice uh, more soft skills, such as teamwork, uh, presenting uh, in front of a large audience. Um, and in my opinion, and that is something uh, that uh, is very important uh, because um, uh, a lot of people um, nowadays uh, focus 
um, on uh, on really lack uh, those uh, very important soft skills. Okay. Now, one of the things we did that was a little unusual that I mentioned was uh, we gave each of you a chance to take shots at the other teams, and then you had a chance to defend yourself against that. Uh, what did you think about that? Did you were, did that upset you or did that excite you? How'd you feel about that? Thank you. So I think, uh, at least for me and my team, that was a really amazing part of the experience. We know that in the real scientific world, when you say something, you will get professionally and sometimes even personally attacked. So you need to be ready to defend yourself. And it was it was great to have that opportunity in an environment where we felt safe and confident that everybody else would be looking at this scientifically and working together to help all of us improve our missions overall. Um, Palemos was equal parts really, really excited for the part of uh, for that phase of the uh, contest and absolutely terrified. Um, I will say that we did not feel we were 100% complete with our mission by the time it was presentation day. I think um, one of our worst enemies was our weird combination of profession of like perfectionism and procrastination. Um, so we went into those rounds knowing that we had a lot of holes that could potentially be attacked. And the entire the entire like night before that day was just like, okay, what do we say about the massive holes we have in our mission? Um, and I think pre-planning was one of the things that we learned. Like you have to have a warm-up. You can't just jump right into it and expect to do as well um as you would if you had at least the murmur of a plan you know so planning always plan <laughs> is i think what we learned from those last two portions always plan your attacks always plan your rebuttals for our team we also just like team three we were both excited but also terrified of like the criticism and rebuttal rounds, but we found the feedback we got from other teams invaluable to help improving our mission. And we also got the chance to analyze what other teams came up with and, you know, seeing how they can improve their missions as well. We, yeah. Yeah, uh, it, it's a real good um, experience to get, especially in the real world, how you might have to defend your own design as well and yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, I think that the concept uh, of uh, uh, criticisms and rebuttals is great but the execution execution of that um, uh, wasn't very great uh, in my opinion um, the teams didn't have enough time uh, really to um, read uh, through all the reports uh, thoroughly. So um, some uh, of the criticisms that our team received um, were uh, that really um, the answer was there in our report. And uh, the, the teams that asked uh, those, those questions probably just didn't have enough time because if you have to read uh, four or five uh, very long reports um, in one or two days, I believe it was. Um, you really, uh, it, it's hard, but uh, um, yeah, the, those criticisms, some were valuable, uh, some uh, were kind of dumb. <laughs> okay. Well, do you think that in real life, people who are rivals who are trying to uh, defeat you are going to be fair in their criticisms? Yeah, that, sure that is not. true. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> hey, uh, Trudy, uh, you, you've uh, done other uh, uh, STEM uh, uh, outreach programs, uh, and also you were a judge of this one. H how would you uh, compare this methodology to some, uh, some of the others? 
I really, I really like that it's it was very realistic. Um, I'm a planetary scientist. Uh, I was at Jet Propulsion Lab and Lunar Planetary Institute. Uh, these days, I teach at a school uh, co-founded by Elon Musk. Um, and to watch these kids work was amazing, and to see the product, the product that they came out with was was I would say higher than most science competitions. Um, it was really impressive to see the system and to see it be realistic, um, and for these kids to have to undergo. Uh, you know, actual criticism um, was, I think, a really good thing for a child to be experienced uh, at this age. Uh, yeah, it was a really cool thing. It's uh, th There's a need for change in um, STEM education, I think, across the world. I think this is a really big step forward. Okay. Um, uh, I'd like to open up to questions from you. Uh, are there people from the floor who have questions? Oh, boy. The fun part. That is a fun part. <laughs> Uh, Benner. Could you make a remark about the roles of mentors in this process? You had them. Did they guide you too much, too little? A lot of times with these science projects, you discover it's the mentor who produces them. This is clearly not the case with you folks. But make some comments about mentors. Um, I feel like the mentors um, were mostly there as somebody that you could ask questions to if you were stuck on either an aspect of the paper or an aspect of your actual research. Um, I found that we were asking ours, like, um, what kind of citations do we use? Um, there's two versions of APA 7th edition for some reason. Which one do we use, school or professional? Um, and a couple questions about just like um, the sources that we were reading, um, the presentations. And I found that for the most part, we could take care of the writing ourselves. Um, it was just the fine things that we needed her help for. Do you go more often to Google? We'd usually try Google first, but if Google gave like weird or conflicting or very vague answers, then it would be best to ask an actual person, you know? Uh, ter terrific uh, presentation and, uh, and responses to everything. I uh, really enjoyed it. I'm curious, given the aspirations for this program in terms of disrupting education, if you had to pick kind of one aspect of your experience, what would you take to your high school? Um, would it be something content related? Would it be the format, the use of mentors? What would be the thing that you would bring back to say this would be a, a, an impactful change to make right away? Uh, I think the the best thing we can take back immediately is the the sort of format where we're not just being taught and we just need to apply it for a test and forget about it. We're really applying learning and understanding all these things we're learning, especially in those science, technology, engineering, math classes. Looks like there's someone over there. Oh, you have someone there. Okay, got it. Hey, um, have you ever uh, seen opportunities for apprenticeships, not just mentoring, in other words, going to work for a business, working in your area of expertise? Have we seen that? I mean, if you're asking if the opportunity has come out of the program, um, not directly, but I think the process of broadening our horizons via this program, um, we've been able to look out more for internships and stuff. Um, there's actually a NASA program that is able to connect high school students with um, space related um, internships, which we're planning to do some exploration on for next summer. Okay, next question. Uh, do you think this experience will make you more likely or less likely to pursue a STEM-related higher education? Definitely more likely. <laughs> Another question? Uh, Hi, uh, oh. impressive work. Each of you clearly came to this competition well-prepared. I wonder briefly what brought you to that point to be ready to do this? Uh, so for me, um, I'm from yeah. Poland. Um, and uh, 
I was taking part in uh, some other competitions, um, for example, um, doing some work about uh, life on Mars uh, uh, and uh, generally um, I was uh, participating in uh, chemistry competitions also. Uh, so this kind of sparked my interest in, uh, in, in space and uh, in generally uh, kind of uh, I learned that uh, participating in, in competitions is the way to go uh, to expand my knowledge and abilities. Okay, uh, and there was a question over here. Oh, I have been. Um, oh, I see. So I was curious, you, you went through the process for the first time of kind of how NASA would do it or how it's standard done in, 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 in the industry. Did you guys have thoughts about things that could be improved about the process that you went through? Like, did it seem correct or did it seem silly in some ways? Uh, let's actually take a vote here. Who here thinks that we needed more time in between the rounds? <laughs> so I think that'd be the one thing I changed. All right, well. You have limited time, unlike NASA, which takes forever. <laughs> and ESA, which takes longer than forever. Um, okay. oh, I have a question for there at you. Uh, we made no attempt to coordinate the opinions of the instructors, okay? You got diametrically opposed opinions, or at least uh, inconsistent opinions uh, and views from the, the very, there were about 12 lecturers that gave you background, okay? So, and you, you had to sort it out. How did you feel about that? Ooh. Can I go? Yeah. All right. Well, um, <laughs> there's no really good way to answer this question without offending somebody, but... <laughs> I think uh, we want we wanted to make sure that we considered all the possibilities. So at least for us, it was almost always good to hear that there was somebody with an opposing view because it made us think that we weren't overlooking something basic. And when we were managing all those ideas, well, what we did was we looked to other people. What do other scientists think about this issue? Uh, what are their goals in trying and what are they trying to accomplish with their point of view? So taking all that into consideration really helped us figure out what decisions we want to make and what we want to learn from each instructor. Yeah, and uh, if you were to select uh, uh, lecturers and judges uh, based on their opinion uh, about a particular subject, then uh, it would kind of limit uh, the possibilities uh, of, of designs that uh, the teams uh, uh, would have provided. So. Um, it, uh, in my opinion, that that's a good thing that um, we have been exposed to th those uh, differing ideas uh, because it uh, allows us uh, uh, to have uh, a choice. And uh, uh, some teams will choose uh, one opinion of one expert. Some teams uh, will think another way and will choose uh, uh, another opinion. Uh, and uh, if there was no uh, difference in opinions, uh, from in the le uh, of lecturers, then probably all of the designs would have looked very similar. Agreed. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So I agree that um, what I think the split of opinion in lecture in lectures did best was kind of scatter the ideas that um, each team searched for. We all had an idea that we liked and latched onto, and then built kind of the rest of it around that. And I think that reflects itself in um, the papers that we publish, which are available in an ebook. This is not a sponsorship. I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to do a sponsorship. Have we published it yet? <laughs> Have we published it yet? No, um, it will be. Um, that is, um, the, the students have had a chance to uh, uh, give final revision to their designs in light of everything they know now. And uh, we've gotten that, that. And we're going to uh, assemble that into a book with an introduction by me and with links to the videos, which are all online 
of every lecture given by all the instructors, of the presentations given by each of the student teams, oh, no. of their attack mode uh, 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 discussions and their rebuttals. It's all there. The entire, the only thing that's not online is their internal discussions in terms of how they develop their designs. But the links to all that's going to be on there. So, you know, you're going to be, you know, 50 years old or 60 years old. You're going to be able to see yourself on YouTube giving oh. your <laughs> presentations and say, boy, I still had hair then. And the, um, uh, but that's going to be forever. That's going to be available, as will the book itself, which will serve, uh, I think, as a guide to school systems or others who want to institute a program of this kind uh, and which we're going to attempt to propagate. Um, now, I should add, by the way, that um, Frank Crossman, who uh, was the editor of many of the Mars Society publications, including, for example, the Mars City State uh, book and the Mars Colonies book. Uh, he is uh, willing to assist in the editing of this, but he would like someone to uh, join him as an associate editor of this publication. We need to train additional uh, e editors because we're also going to have another book we're going to publish, which is of the Telerobotic Mars Mission Competition. Um, but yeah, this book is it, it's going to be out. It'll be available both in paperback and Kindle. Um, and it's going to take a little time, but probably I think by January it'll be published. Um, okay, so there it is. Uh, and everybody should buy one. Um, <laughs> and uh, as well as copies for everyone you know um, for Christmas. Um, the um, Anyway, um, it looks like uh, we're about out of time. So if you want to hear more, uh, the uh, the other three teams, the European and the two North American teams, will be presenting uh, this afternoon in a track, so you can see what their designs were like. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one thing I want to do, exactly. since we're all here, let's just shake hands really quickly. Yes. Get it done. Uh, oh, wait, we need to stand up for this, guys. Oh yeah. Oh, every, all the students, all the students come up. Oh, everybody? All uh, students? Uh, uh, come on, Sebastian. Can all the students come up, please? Everyone that's in the hall? Yeah, let's. You guys could just stand in front here. Oh, standing in front? No, no, no. The other edition. You guys stand in front. You guys on the panel stand up. We're cool with this. We are. We are. We are. Okay, I think the picture one, one more time. Take the shot. Come on, guys. Should be looking at. Oh, just looking down there. Stay on the wall. Marson. 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 Okay, Chris, uh, if you want to do a quick sound check and start your video. Sound check one, two, three. Um, um, zoom up, please. Zoom up. Go ahead again, Chris. One, two, three. Uh, can you hear me? One more time, please, Chris. One, two, three. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, great. You can go ahead and share your slides now. And you can begin whenever you're ready. Great. Can you uh, can you see my slides? I see your PowerPoint edit view, not the presentation view. There you go. That's the presentation view. You're good now. Yep. Sounds good. Um, can I can I commence? Again, please. 
Okay, great. F thanks. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much for the invitation and uh, apologies uh, for not being in person. Actually, I had uh, everything sorted out. And uh, in, the, in the last minute, uh, for some personal reasons, I had to cancel the travel. Um, because I always love to attend uh, uh, the, the conference. And uh, I just listened to a, you know, a presentation by students. And that's our future. So I'm super excited about uh, what what these guys are doing. Uh, there is one note about YouTube. I'm not sure what, whether YouTube is still going to exist, right? In a, when they're 50 or 60 years old, there may be some some other, the way things are going, you know, uh, there may be some other uh, channel. So so today I want to talk about two things that have been, uh, that I've been working on for a, you know, large portion of my professional career for almost two decades. And uh, they, they split into two, uh, two sort of mini me presentations. Uh, the first one is I'm gonna talk about technologies uh, that, uh, that will be required to, to find life on Mars. And then I'm going to talk about technology that uh, will be required to sustain human life on Mars. So let's, let's start with the first one, uh, search for life. A, Search for life, um, if, you, if you're looking for, for life, you have to consider the three ingredients of life. Uh, these are a, a ke chemistry, it's chemicals. Uh, you need to have uh, certain elements that make up say organic matter. If you don't have them, probability that there is life is slim. Uh, you also need um, a heat, um, the thermal energy, uh, whether it's chemical, uh, sun, uh, geothermal, um, any source of energy is fine, um, but that's that's one of the prerequisites for life. You need you need energy, and finally, to 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 find life as we know it, you obviously need water, and um, doesn't have to be ultra pure water. It could be you know, dirty water, salty water, but you still need water. So Mars um, is uh, one of these planets that have all three ingredients. That's why it's very exciting uh, to go and and explore. A couple of years ago, uh, the Mars Express, actually an instrument, Marsis on Mars Express, um, found, uh, found lakes um, in a large, very, very large lakes in a, just below South Polar Lake deposits in the South uh, Pole of Mars. Uh, these lakes are approximately one mile deep. And uh, these lakes are not at zero C. Uh, they are somewhere between, you know, the tens of degrees below freezing. And what that means is they are actually hypersaline lakes. Um, so yeah, there are some microbes that can, uh, that, you know, do just fine in a hot, very salty waters and um, extremely hot, uh, salty waters. So, uh, you know, potential for finding something in these lakes is I would say pretty high. Uh, and uh, if we find, you know, a couple of lakes in the South Pole, uh, I'm sure there's there are many, many other lakes not just in the south, but also in the north. And uh, we actually have been to north too. Uh, Mars Phoenix uh, landed uh, in, 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 over a decade ago in the uh, uh, northern polar regions, uh, regions of Mars. And uh, wh while it was landing, the thrusters uh, and in, uh, underneath the deck excavated uh, soil, ex excava excavated Martian regolith and exposed ice or isometric ground. So ice, if you go closer to north, um, it's, it's right sitting right at the surface. So it's not, you know, out of, uh, you know, not a crazy idea to, to penetrate through this ice and uh, get down to some kind of a lake. So even go down uh, through ice and, uh, and explore it. So uh, the, we have been focusing on, on these sort of technologies that will go through uh, ice or ice that has a bit of uh, sediments. And the way to test it, uh, you know, ideally is to go to, uh, uh, to areas where, which have um, uh, ice shells and, uh, and some lakes underneath. So one of the example is Devon Island in the Arctic. Uh, I've been to Devon and uh, Mars Society has a, uh, has a base uh, outside of Houghton Crater on Devon Island as well on the, on the Western Devon Island. So um, one way to do this is to go to these locations and uh, uh, set uh, on ice and uh, test the uh, probes that, that go uh, you know, below. So on the right-hand side, 
this is this is example when you start and you penetrate right through and and then you get down uh, to um, to lake. We have uh, for for many years we have been actually developing uh, probes like this for penetrating of Europa, but some of the or very similar designs could also be used for Mars. This particular probe is called SLUSH, and SLUSH stands for Search for Life Using Submersible Heated Drill. Um, this this system is uh, this probe is just over half a meter diameter, so it's not a small thing. It's not a small thing. Um, it's it's large diameter, driven primarily by uh, the reactor that it has kilopower nuclear reactor, and the probe is just over five meter tall. And if you go from a <clears throat> from the bottom to the top on this inner picture, on the center picture, what you see is a drill bit with some kind of a percussive system. Then you have a kilopower nuclear reactor. Uh, then you have a Stirling engine for converting heat uh, coming from a nuclear reactor into electricity. Then you have a couple of high temperature uh, motors, batteries, electronics, uh, instruments. Um, idea is to obviously suction some of the, some of the water, look for, for microbes electronics and a communication spoolers. Uh, the way this probe penetrates is by uh, breaking ice and also melting it to form slush and pictured on the left, left hand side. And as it penetrates down, uh, the slush refreezes um, above the, the probe. So whatever is left in a, um, in a freeze channel is a, is a communication tether. We have a, have done prototyping of these sort of systems. Uh, right on top, you can see the slush probe. This probe is just over six centimeter diameter and uh, uh, one point, almost 1.5 meter tall. Uh, if you if you were to if you look through the cross section right towards the bottom, what you see is uh, uh, drill bits with motors and heaters because it's a heated system. Uh, some percussion system, slip rings. Uh, electric motors right in the center, you have anti torque assembly because if you're spinning, uh, there has to be counter torque, right? And uh, so we have these skids to, for providing uh, counter torque. And right on top, we have a tether bay for, um, that comes out from a, from a probe and refreezes behind uh, as slash turns back into, into ice. So uh, we've done, we have vacuum chambers uh, here in, uh, in beautiful Altadena outside of NASA Jet Propulsion Lab in Los Angeles. And uh, we have been uh, running a couple of tests to show which of the uh, mining uh, drilling system is actually most, uh, most useful. So what you see on the, on the, in these short videos um, taken inside the Mars vacuum chamber is a probe initially melting through, uh, through ice. The process is kind of slow. Uh, the, the video on the left hand side is 300x. In the center, we use purely mechanical system. And on the right hand side, we use combined uh, melting and, and uh, mechanical drilling. Um, so at the, in a long story short, uh, melting is very slow and it's very power intensive. Mechanical is very fast <clears throat> and very uh, energy intensive. However, the issue with mechanical system is um, sooner or later you're going to choke up because there's no means of moving chips around the probe and uh, uh, to the top of the probe. Whereas a slushing eliminates the problem with, mecha with mechanical has and is significantly faster than, uh, than pure melting. Um, so that's why we called, uh, you know, we're doing slushing and that's why uh, the drill is called slush. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, um, once you, you go at the certain depth below the ground, what happens is uh, the, the borehole closes and just within the, where the drill bit is, it starts melting. So the probe on the left hand side, as you can see is a probe starts melting ice uh, to, form, <clears throat> to form slush. And uh, the, way, the reason why we know it when this happens is because sublimation stops and uh, whenever uh, drill sublimes, you can see these chips flying out um, out of the hole, and they're flying out of the hole because they're propelled by sublimed water vapor. Um, so water vapor is a sort of natural drilling fluid 
gas that blows the chips out of the, out of the way. Once we get deep enough, uh, all this sublimation stops and you start uh, going into the melting regime. And finally, when you're very close to the, to the lake, um, again, uh, here you have a high, relatively high temperature <clears throat> and a high pressure because you're sitting in a, in a bubble uh, pictured on the, on the left-hand side. And uh, uh, again, just like in previous uh, pictures, slushing is, is the best. Um, it has relatively high energy efficiency and also a relatively high penetration rate of just over a meter an hour. So all the tests work really well uh, in the lab. <clears throat> so we decided to build uh, something uh, simple or slightly, slightly simpler, uh, purely, uh, you know, just pure melt probe <clears throat> and, uh, and go just last, last summer in uh, uh, June, July timeframe to Devon Island. So we went to Resolute and you can see a helicopter in Resolute on Cornwallis Island. And um, we are waiting first for weather to clear and when it did, um, we flew, we took a probe and we flew on, um, on this uh, ice cap. <clears throat> Over here on the right-hand side is, uh, uh, is a video, uh, slightly sped up, showing a probe penetrating through, through ice. And right in the center, which you can see is just a beautiful, magnificent view of, a, uh, of the ice cap uh, with a helicopter and, uh, um, uh, and our team uh, putting the, the probe in through the ice and, uh, and looking at penetration rates. Uh, this, this test was cut short uh, because of the weather. Uh, we had to turn around a couple of hours later and uh, go back, but we're planning to go again um, next year and uh, deploy slightly deeper, uh, more than, than two meters. We only had enough time to deploy two meters. And the one of you may ask, well, why helicopter? Why not um, airplane? The thing is, it gets warm, and um, you get a bit of a slash on the surface. <clears throat> so if you if you try to land with a um, hey Chris, yeah, Chris, I apologize. Uh, we just lost Wi-Fi here for about a minute or two. Okay. So could you just go back on your presentation about ninety seconds? Repeat that. Thank you. Okay. Not a not a problem. Um, so what you see here is an um, uh, ice cap uh, on Devon Island. Um, it's, it's you know, close to a kilometer thick. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we, we used a helicopter, not an not a aeroplane or uh, such as twin otter with, uh, with skis, because uh, ice gets warm. And uh, as it gets warm, obviously, the friction increases, so you cannot land. <clears throat> if you land, then obviously you cannot take off because of too much friction. So that's why we, we went with a helicopter. On the right-hand side, you can see a video of a probe um, penetrating through, uh, through ice and uh, a couple of meters down. We only had a few, literally a few hours to do this experiment before weather <clears throat> turned and you had to, you had to go back to the resolute. But we are going around two meters per hour at the power of 600 watts. So this is going to continue. We're going to go back uh, next year and uh, try to deploy a bigger probe <coughs> slightly deeper. All right, so let me uh, switch, the, uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about mining water on Mars. Uh, this is a beautiful picture of a futuristic uh, human base on the surface of Mars with starships. And um, to, for, this, for this picture to become reality, you obviously need uh, water, oxygen, and carbon. Um, and you need these, uh, uh, these elements for fuel. Uh, Starship requires a lot of water, a lot of methane. You also need energy, like for example, fuel cell at night to generate electrical power. Uh, you have a beautiful greenhouses that obviously need water and, uh, uh, and obviously a life. For life support, you, you also need water. And, and then oxygen. In fact, I would say life support doesn't require as much water and, and oxygen as fuel and, and energy and, and agriculture. That's why, that's why it's right at the bottom. Now, why, why, do we, why don't we just bring everything to Mars with us? And the, the issue is um, this so-called gear factor. Um, for every kilogram that we put on the surface of Mars, we have to launch 226 kilograms from the surface of Earth. 
So if you want one ton of uh, water on Mars, you have to ship 200, you have to launch 226 uh, tons uh, from, a, from the surface of Mars. So uh, things you know, add up very, very quickly and it becomes pretty apparent that you have to do some mining on the surface of Mars to make it feasible. In terms of water as a resource, on Mars, actually, Mars is very rich. You have, you have quite, quite a few options. You have liquid water, as I mentioned earlier. You have ice as pure ice or ice in the ground. You have also hydrated minerals, like, for example, gypsum, which has around 20% of, uh, 20 of uh, water. Regular by itself, there's uh, you know, some fraction of water and obviously atmosphere. So here, what I'm going to focus on is uh, extracting of ice um, in uh, these sort of areas, like Arcadia Planitia. Recently, there has been study uh, looked at what would be the ideal location to, uh, to set up a base. One of them is Arcadia Planitia. Uh, the reason why it was selected is because elevation is relatively low, so you have more atmosphere to slow you down. Uh, it's relatively at the low latitude, which means you have access to sun. Um, the number of rocks that are larger than a meter is, is less than 5%. So that's good. The slopes are relatively benign. Um, you have a couple of landing locations in a, within a kilometer proximity, and you have water. And uh, we found lots of water below 10 to 20 meters of regolith in these, in these sort of ice sheets. So uh, uh, we start developing a technology called the red water uh, to get down through regolith and they get down to these ice sheets. So right in the center, what you see um, is, a, is a red water. Um, it's an ISRU system uh, that combines two technologies that have been used commercially here on Earth. So they, these two technologies um, stood the, you know, uh, the test of time. Um, the, on the right-hand side, what you see is a cold tubing technology. Cold tubing uh, drilling is a, is a means of making a hole using uh, a tube. It could be a steel tube, sort of like your garden hose that is um, re-bent into a straight pipe. So you have a pretty powerful uh, injector system that turns a curved uh, tube into a straight tube. Um, and you can, you can go thousands of feet um, on the, on the, here on Earth for oil and gas and, and mining. On the left-hand side, uh, you have something called red water. Uh, this is a system used in the South Pole in Antarctica to deliver uh, fresh well, well, water to the, uh, to the base. The way it works is uh, uh, it, has, uh, it, it sprays hot water um, through the, uh, down uh, tens of meters below the ice uh, to form cavity. And as you spray hot water, this hot water melts water around it. And then the pump pumps the water, melted water to the, uh, to the surface. Some of this water is stored, some of this is, it goes through the, through the generator and heat the system, it goes back down to spray more water. So we combine these two and then to form a, a you know, red water system. <clears throat> now, uh, we, we build actually a system. Uh, this is an example. Um, the reel itself for 25 meter penetration is approximately meter in a, it's half a meter diameter. So this entire injector system with a drum is close to a meter. Uh, then we have a bottom pole assembly, uh, which includes heaters and motors and uh, a, lot of, a lot of tubing. Uh, and this is a picture of a red water with tanks. So you have a, a tank for compressed CO2 and tank for water. Um, this, this entire system weighs around 66 kilograms. So it's not, that heavy. Uh, the way it drills is uh, you can see this cold tubing. We're actually flying a, a much smaller version of rare water to the moon next year. So you have this tube on the left hand side, you can see kind of spools out, goes between the pulleys and injects compressed gas. And this vacuum chamber is actually under Mars pressures. So uh, you can see the gas in vacuum, in the Martian vacuum, is extremely, extremely powerful. So uh, uh, we can drill with uh, the drill bit cuts the formation, but the gas is used to blow the cuttings out of the hole. So I'm gonna play this thing again. Um, 
And uh, you know, it's not just dust, but you can you can see the verroclets being blown out of the hole at the same time. So if this this and goes around meter per minute. So this thing goes to the moon uh, next year as a technology demonstrator. It's a heat code probe, but the red water is essentially a bigger brother of the, of the system. This tubing is around 40 inch. Red water is is one inch in diameter. So to to extract water. Uh, you deploy the cold tubing, uh, you drill, and you're using compressed gas to blow the cuttings out of the hole. <clears throat> Once you get to ice, you have a pack packer system that uh, pushes against the surface. Uh, and then you start the melting process. You spin the drill bit, you turn the heat on, and you slowly make this uh, melt pool. Once you create enough melt pool, you pressurize it, and uh, water under pressure uh, flows to the surface. So there are no pumps, no pumps. Uh, this entire area is pressurized. Water under pressure flows to the tank on the surface. So uh, this shows a step one, which is pneumatic uh, drilling. This here, you, what you can see is a drill uh, going through the uh, 1.5 meter columns of ice, and you can see the snow being blown out. So this is how we how we drilling. You can see the injector over here that sits right over there. Uh, the way you you see whether the injector is working or not. On this side, the tube is smooth. On a, on this side, the tube is uh, cut with the teeth. Uh, the the force required uh, to to bend it is so high that you uh, uh, plastically deform the tube. So that's why you have these these teeth from a from a driver gears. Here we show that how the packer can be inflated. So we go down and you can see the packer sitting right over here. And here the packer sits inside the ice column uh, and maintains pressure of uh, you know, 40 PSI. And finally, when we got down to the, to the bottom, we actually put a die to, to, so that we can see how the, uh, what is being formed. But you could see that there is a melt pool being formed uh, in, in a, uh, in an ice column and um, with the packer sitting right right around. So uh, a great, you know, great uh, uh, technology so far. The, we, we did actually drill uh, a melt uh, with no rotation and rotation. So here we went down, we stopped and we were melting by itself. And uh, in these two cases, we were rotating while melting. And uh, look down here, this is a system efficiency, how much heat went in to melt, um, to melt ice. And uh, if, if the most efficient system was obviously rotation uh, when you were rotating. And, and uh, we melt up to what, 100, almost 100 liters um, in, uh, in 15 hours with 30% efficiency. And the reason why rotation is required is sort of like when you, you know, when you put a, uh, you know, sugar in a, in a tea, if you don't stir it, obviously it's not gonna dissolve. Uh, same thing here, the heat doesn't go, the water is actually really bad uh, conductor of heat, really, really bad. So you have to keep on move water, water around and use, you know, convection um, to, to stir it around and they heat up ice. Uh, so it works. Um, and finally, obviously, uh, after melting, we have to do um, uh, the pressurization. So here we pressurizing the borehole. Um, here we pressurizing and we pumping along a 11 meter tubing. So you can see water goes through this tubing and right into this container. And finally, uh, the tubing is down here in ice. Um, and uh, we, we pressurize the borehole we are opening the tap and all it goes into the red water goes into the uh, into a container. Obviously, uh, this is done under atmospheric conditions. So let's see um, if it works under uh, under Mars conditions inside the vacuum chamber. This is a simple experiment. You can do it yourself in a small vacuum with a container. It has an opening going into the into the container into a water container under Mars pressure. And uh, we pressurized it. And uh, by pressurization of this container, we're pumping water to this container over here. So the idea of essentially pumping water to the surface, it works. 
And finally, we had to do end-to-end -end tests. This is our cold room, just over five meter tall, uh, with uh, one point five meter tall of super clear ice. You can see the uh, cold tubing sitting right over here before being uh, moved to the top. And right over here, the, in this picture, you can see the cold tubing sitting on top and the bottom pole assembly uh, drilling down over here. Uh, in this particular case. Uh, we needed around one kilowatt of heater power, um, and the uh, melting efficiency of was around fifty percent. Okay, so this end-to-end -end worked, and then um, here we did everything in our Mars chamber. This is three and a half meter or eleven foot Mars chamber with a, a red water sitting right above a drum full of ice. Um, so we drilled down. We melted, we pressurized the borehole, and then we pumped uh, to the um, the to this to this jar, to the bottle, to the glass bottle uh, that was actually sitting. It's also inside the inside the marsh chamber. So we uh, mined around six liters. Um, so it's a good first step. Um, TRL, you know, TRL five, and right now we are building uh, TRL six system. Uh, this is uh, the next generation red water. It's sitting, uh, this is how it looked like uh, last week, was sitting on an assembly bench. So you can see um, a, the you know, swivel right over here, the drum sits inside this hex. And uh, here the bottom pole assembly is gonna go through the, through the injector system. Now, the, this entire architecture of drilling down, it's, you don't necessarily need to use it just for, for mining eyes. You can deploy, um, it could be used for uh, as a sci scientific mission, for astrobiology mission. So uh, this is an example where a lander can be dropped by a sky crane. Um, you deploy, you drill down tens of meters right at the bottom. You have bottom hole assembly with cameras, with near infrared spectrometers, with neutron spectrometers. So this is actually neutron spectrometer, uh, with heaters, uh, dielectric perme permeability. Uh, spectrometer. So uh, this is this is our TRL five system uh, for a you know scientific mission that can go literally tens of meters below the ground with I, I would say around 100 kilograms total, including avionics and uh, uh, compressed gas and and uh, things like this required to for this thing to work. If you if you would like more information, we published a lot of books on the subject uh, of a decade ago. Uh, th this book covered pretty much everything up to 2008, 2009, and recently released uh, two books cover all the information up to approximately 2019, 2020, the latest. So uh, with this, I'm going to end with this beautiful picture from a uh, uh, few years ago when we went to do drilling in, in uh, outside of a summit station in, in Greenland. It was a lot of fun. So I'll stop here and uh, happy to answer uh, any other questions you may have. Thank you, Chris. We've got time for some questions. Right here. When you're pumping of this, it's not necessarily pure water. It's good as slurry. How thick of a slurry can it be pumping up? So actually, it's it's not gonna be a slurry. A slurry is gonna we're gonna wait for a, what if you have any sediments. Uh, we're gonna wait for sediments to settle down in the bottom. The intake uh, for for water is is gonna be close. It's it's not gonna be at the drill bit. Uh, it's gonna be you know some distance above the above the drill bit, a couple of feet, a couple of meters. So uh, the water will have some sediments, uh, will have some particulates, but it's, it's not gonna be slurry. And this is also a reason why uh, we decided to pressurize the borehole as opposed to have a pump. Uh, we didn't, it's easier to pressurize a borehole and have a thick tube for which some particulates can, can flow to the top without jamming, as opposed to have a pump, right? With some uh, the diaphragm pipe or some gears and so on that could jam when you when you try to pump fluid with with some uh, sediments. Other questions?
So we've been talking to Catherine Bywaters in your organization, and everybody agrees that this the next mission to Mars should slap an agnostic life finder on a 13 liter um, mining operation that is produced by your red water. The question is, how do you make this happen? Well, you, you obviously need to, I would say, wait, wait a few years, right? Uh, uh, until the Mars sample return mission is in a uh, no, coming towards the end, and uh, the spending uh, allows you to, uh, to actually develop um, something like a red water for, for scientific applications. And then obviously you have to uh, have a, a you know, community input uh, from MEPAC meetings. But um, uh, so it's a matter of time. I don't think it's, it's uh, if, it's, it's a matter of when, and the when depends on a uh, on a profile, a funding profile, and uh, sooner or later, mission like like this is gonna is going to happen. Um, there is no doubt you have to go deep, right? You have to go really, really deep to have any chance of finding past past life. Um, so the technology exists, and uh, uh, I think I also think that uh, emphasis should be given on a downhole uh, technology uh, development for. Uh, for looking at microbes downhole. The good example is something I presented a couple of years ago at the Mars Society with the system is called Watson. Um, uh, the, we built a sort of drilling system and, and uh, uh, Rob Barsha and Luther Beagle and others at, at that time, the JPL, they built a downhole deep UV Raman spectrometer, which was essentially repackaged Sherlock instrument from, uh, from Mars 2020. And we went to Greenland, and uh, we found um, we found microbes. Uh, they live in the colony, um, but the issue is the the life is not spread all around. So they, it it's in a, lives in a tiny colonies, like like we do here on Earth, right? We we live in in cities. We're not equally spread across the entire planet. We live in cities. So life is lives in these tiny colonies. So that's why you need a downhole instrumentation. So as you go down you actually scan a bottle real time. If you just capture a bit of sample every so often, it's, it's a hit and miss. Uh, you may find absolutely nothing, even if you're sitting right next to the colony. Last question. Uh, this is going to be a quick question. Uh, could you make a system uh, light enough to be delivered using Rocket Lab Electron or uh, the next generation Rocket Lab rocket? Uh, not Electron, but next generation, yes. Uh, definitely, yes. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned the commercial aspects of this. Uh, we see, you know, Rocket Lab is, is launching science instruments to Venus, and uh, there is definitely, uh, a, you know, room for, a, you know, for commercial uh, companies like, like Rocket Labs, or even Blue Origin that, that, that owns Honeybee Robotics now to do a lot of this uh, scientific exploration. So yes, the future ge next generation of, of Rocket Labs rocket, yes, uh, Electron is, is essentially too small. Thank you very much, Dr. Zachney. Thank you. So this concludes our morning session. I'd like to make a special plug for the other student teams that are gonna to present today. They'll be in a new room for the conference. They'll be in Ventana A. Ventana A is uh, out the door to the left and then left at the hallway and then on the left again. It's right across from where the merch table was on day one, if you remember that. Um, there's also some other really amazing tracks today as well. We're going to have our telerobotic Mars expedition design competition finalists and judges today uh, scoring in this room at one o'clock. And there's a track called Humanity's Future, which has some really excellent talks. Uh, so I hope, we hope you're enjoying the conference and go get some lunch and come back and learn some more. Thank you. And Robert is signing books over at the merch table. So take advantage. <laughs>